right, welcome back once again to Kevin Pollock's Chat Show. I am, as always, Chat Show. How are you? It's so nice to see and or hear you again. And by that, I mean myself. Uh, today's show brought to you by two wonderful and uh, forward-thinking intelligent sponsors. The first one being Ting.com. I'll tell you more about them soon. And also Tonks, a new sponsor to the show. That's T-O-N-X. Tonks for ridiculously fresh, if not the freshest, coffee available by delivery to your home within 24 hours. Tonks for the coffee. Of leaving the field. It goes from the field to your face in 24 hours, I ask you. What is D if I say? <laughs> nice. Good day to you as well. Uh, uh, Jamie and Sammy, what, what's new by you? Sammy, let's start with you, if we may. Yeah. He's got a beard now. I got a beard going. Uh-huh. And by that, do you mean someone to cover up the fact that you're a homosexual? What else could I possibly <laughs> And a uh, surprise to everyone, it only took you less than two weeks to grow that current level. Yeah, this is like 12 days in. So see me in a few more weeks. That's well, don't why, say it like. That why you're a little Wolverine? This is a little bit why I'm a little Wolverine. Don't yeah. say it like you're going to give John Hamm a run for his money. No, I'm going to give Galifianakis a run for his money. <laughs> wow, a bushman. I don't believe you're going to be a bushman face wise. Yeah. I'll see. Uh, is that, in fact, the news you'd like to share with us? Are you done? No, I was just I'm, I was for a film, shooting a film, and I have to play a bad guy, so I thought I should have a beard to define. Lensing a pick? You know, as they as they would say in the trades. Uh-huh. Are yeah. you going to wing in from Gotham to lens the pick? I'm going to wing in from Gotham to lens the pick. It's being uh, uh, authored or, what is the, what's the Pen? script? Pen? Pen. Is that the one Pen. they Let's just hope Pen? the person in charge is not ankled before you start production. <laughs> That's my favorite, because it makes no fucking sense. No sense. No, because the others do. Uh, well, good luck on the picture and tell us more about it. Thank you. In the weeks to come. I will tell you more about it in the weeks to come as long as it does not get shut down in the interim. Because the head of the uh, financing has been ankled. <laughs> and Jamie, ankling of your own? Um, some pe uh, well, may maybe it was just one person, but I'm going to say people. I'm going to use plural. Please do. <laughs> We're asking about mine and Lon's Mad Men recap show if it was, if it was coming back. Well, season. you do a podcast. We do. It is back. And the name it of that podcast. It just has a new name. It yeah. used to be This Week in Mad Men. Right. But since we all know that went defunct. Uh -huh. It is now Mad Men colon You Watch It. You Watch It. And you can find that on iTunes. Well, it's been made a little easier to find on iTunes. Because uh, we've been mentioned in new and noteworthy podcasts. You've been listed. Yeah, that is gigantic, listening. and a little yeah. congratulations, if yeah. you may, please. This, there are now, are... there it is, a little screenshot for those of you watching, you know, under the new and noteworthy, Mad Men, you watch it. Uh, so if you're Thursday. a giant nutty fan of Mad Men, like Lon and I are, we, yeah. what we, my friend, uh, my friend Juan actually um, said it best. He's like, it's great because you Google the shit for us, so we don't have to Google it, and then you talk about it for an hour, and then we like, you know, like talk about like all the history that's going on, you know, in uh, coinciding with like the plot of the show and like all, you know all the nuances and everything. So we just like really nerd out about it for like an hour. Yeah, you do. And it's if fair. I may, I love mm -hmm. uh, our dear friend Juan. I believe he's uh, undersold uh, the brilliance of the show. A little bit more than the doing the Googling for the uh, audience. You guys research the hell well, out of it. that was just his way of being clever. Yeah. But uh, we do. We do put a lot of effort, time and effort into it. And we, um, so whenever a new episode of Mad Men airs, the next day we record the podcast. So by Tuesday morning after a new episode airs, you can find it on iTunes. Find it on the iTunes. Mm -hmm. And um, our guest today, I'm very excited to talk to him for many reasons, one of which was he directed an episode in the first season of the very, very mentioned Mad Men. Um, so there you go. All right. Well, thanks, guys. Um, we are coming to you live, for those of you watching live on YouTube. I know you may be watching or listening to us after the fact, fuckers, but uh, join us live, won't you, sometime? Simply go to YouTube uh, slash user slash Kevin Pollock's chat show, or just type in Kevin Pollock's chat show in the YouTube search window, and you'll find us live. I usually uh, tweet it as to the live shows, as I did today's, um, so you can follow there. Um, but yeah, join us sometime. In the meantime, write to us at contact at kevinpollockschatshow.com. Contact at kevinpollockschatshow.com. Let us know, A, how you watch the show, when and where and why, and um, also get involved in any way you might like to, as in record your own Larry King game. <clears throat> Once again, I will have our guest today do the Larry King game. Um, if you go to the YouTube channel, you'll see uh, just a ton of other guests doing the Larry King game. Um, our theme song, uh, 
by award-winning composer Brian Tyler came from a theme song contest. Uh, if you want to make a run at Brian Tyler, I say go for it. Go for it. We're madly in love with our theme song, but if you got them balls, bring it. Yeah. As the kids said a couple years ago. We're as madly in love with our theme song as Brian Tyler is madly in love with himself. How dare you? Let's hope that Brian is watching. <laughs> he knows I'm teasing. He knows I. You that's know what? Why. You know what? He's got every reason to love himself. Fortunately, yeah. he's <laughs> narcissistic enough, as am I, to uh, be delighted. That he you couldn't. Him I wouldn't have way, said it if I knew he would have actually been hurt. <laughs> um, d don't be a nudnik if you're watching live and talk shit in the chat room. Jamie is uh, uh, taking all of your questions there. We have Tweet Fives for our guests. Write some Tweet Fives. That'd be this or that, Coke or Pepsi, no correct. Uh, five questions directly designed for the guest. Um, other news, of course, is that we've been licensed uh, all existing shows and all new shows by the wonderful folks at Earwolf.com, which I highly recommend, as the number one comedy podcast network. Um, specializing in the audio, but they've uh, made the transition to video as well, so we're thrilled to be a part of their team. Consequently, a new show will drop uh, every two weeks. Do they still still say drop, or am I talking from the 90s? No, you could pull a Doug Benson. Debuts. Plopped. Plops. Yeah, Doug uh, And a new episode uh, premieres every couple of weeks, every other Thursday. The next one will be this coming Thursday, the 25th, I want to say, with Gillian Jacobs. The lovely and delightful and charming, and also from Pittsburgh, Gillian Jacobs. Uh, upcoming guests, filmmaker Eli Roth, the hilarious actor Jason Manzoukas, the hilarious and delightful Bonnie Hunt, hilarious and now world-renowned comedian and Twitter god Rob Delaney, internet sensation filmmaker Freddie W., or Freddie Wong, for those of you in the, out of the know, filmmaker Peter Farrelly, and actor Michael C. Hall, just to name uh, people that I've read about and possibly booked. Um, I think that's it. Write a, uh, subscribe to us if you would. If, you, if it wouldn't kill you, subscribe to us on YouTube or Earwolf and or both. W write us a review. If you give a shit, people are always asking, sending emails to contact at kevinpollockschacha.com. How can I help? Well, I'm telling you, you can. Get involved. Reach out. Don't be afraid. Our very own Dr. Chen wearing a fantastic Donald Duck uh, cap today ties in perfectly with our uh, first guest and as I was thinking about introducing him. He too had such a love of Donald Duck that in high school may or may not have worn a Donald Duck pin, which I can't wait to ask him uh, the sort of uh, smiles and or beatings that came his way because of it. Please welcome Paul Feig. Hello, Hello. sir. Oh, I forgot you have a research department. <laughs> may I ask him Great. a Donald Duck trivia Ugh. question? Donald Duck were you were you truly a Donald Duck? A, a true Donald I, Duck? I was a big fanatic. Do you know Donald his middle Duck. name? Oh boy. Uh oh, Mayday. T the. <laughs> it's Fauntleroy, Donald Fauntleroy oh. Duck, because of the type of hat that he wears. It's a little Lord little Fauntleroy. Fauntleroy. Oh, okay. Well, there see. You there you go. There's a little go. Donald trivia for that you. Might have, might, might have staved off some of the beatings. I really <laughs> yeah, I had that information exactly. Because I'm oh, sure they were right. like, "Tell us the middle name." <laughs> <laughs> You're not a fan. Yeah. They guys got beaten up by bigger Donald Duck fans. You should have so. what, and you should have committed and then actually worn a Fauntleroy cap yourself. Oh, yeah. yeah, you should have. <laughs> it's not too late. I, I could rock one pretty well. I yeah, think. actually, just according well, to my Send David out. I'm throwing sure off the internet. Uh huh. Sorry. Now, yeah. <laughs> uh, now, fortunately, in the Mount Clemens, Michigan, yes, where allegedly you were raised, <laughs> um, uh, like Sam and myself, you uh, started with the stand-up comedy before you were legally allowed to consume alcohol. Yes. In the venues in which you were performing. Fifteen years old. Yes. Fifteen. Uh, we, well, you, we're of the same era. Similar. Remember a show, a little show called uh, uh, Make Me Laugh. Sure. Which I think personally started the stand-up craze, weirdly, or helped kind of kick it off a yeah, little bit. Yeah. Just because that suddenly all these comedy clubs were popping up. But, but uh, I started at a place called the Delta Lady, which was a uh, biker bar on Woodward Avenue right around like eight, eight, eight Mile, which is where you know, Eminem made famous. Sure. Uh, very rough part of town. Yeah, 15 years old, I said to my parents, I want to do this, and so... Uh, and I want to start at a biker bar. Yes, that, 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 so my two loves came together, biker bars and, and comedy. <laughs> right. But um, Dave Collier was was uh, kind of, he was already kind of being, a, he was already established when uh, when I was there. He, so he was kind of the superstar. Mike Binder, who was on Make Me Laugh. Yeah, exactly. Binder was already kind of, he was at superstar status. And, right. and uh, yeah, so it was, you know, it was wild. I, I have a recording in my, I found the tape recently. I don't haven't transferred it yet, but of my very first stand-up routine, and it's it's horrendous, of course. Let's hope. 
You yes. were 15. I was 15 years old. Yeah. I, I, I talked in this weird monotone where I kind of, and I would just blow up at the end of a joke, and I would just keep talking like that the whole time. Which was delightful at a biker bar, especially. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, the biker bar was chosen because it was the only venue that would allow somebody to get up at a microphone? Or? I bet. I bet, uh, because this, I think it was before, I mean, maybe Mark Ridley had, had the Comedy Castle going at that point. I'm not sure. I, well, I think that's where think Binder he, and Kuya Oh, that's right. Yeah, they were all doing it. Yeah. So this that's... Why I am curious how you was it just the first venue from your house because uh, you know I, <laughs> if you're gonna choose yes I think I might have found it like in in the the, the paper or something right. you know because I was just looking for night. open yeah totally and of course you know, that they were the only place to take a 15 year old although they didn't even want to let me in I had to bring my parents with me. I would think bikers uh, w might find you a wonderful novelty. I got a lot of laughs, but only in reviewing the tape. I think many of them were derogatory. <laughs> so, uh, but I took it. I remember we went to Shakey's afterward and had a, have a big, a big celebration of my, uh -huh. my wonderful routine that in included lots of New Jersey jokes. Even though I lived, it was from Detroit. That's because Johnny had always made New Jersey jokes. So. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I was and doing Johnny, Johnny Carson's act. Yes, Johnny Carson, for those you kids. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so uh, what an illustrious beginning to my, my stand-up career. So does that mean Carson was an early sort of influence, perhaps? Oh, yeah. Oh, I, I mean, I would, you know, my, my dad always had this really draconian, like, bedtime for me. And I, what, in, in junior high, I had to, like, get a petition signed by all my friends for to be not have to go to bed at like 7 30 or something insane like that so i don't know why he did i think he just tried to get me get rid of me <laughs> but but so i find but occasionally i would be able to stay up and watch the tonight show and eventually all the time but the excitement i would feel when like the, the drums would start up and you're just waiting and then that curtain you'd wait and he always kind of delay before he came out yes i would get i do that so, to this day by the way it's the greatest yeah, yeah. just that build that anticipation yeah. But anyway, I, I just never got over how excited I was when Johnny walked out, and, and yeah, so he was just a big, big influence. I share that enthusiasm uh, then and now when I conjure the image in my head of him walking through that curtain. Mm -hmm. um, uh, truly impactful yeah. to, to anyone who had uh, inclinations or desires uh, to do comedy, yeah. that became the fantasy. That was showbiz. I mean, that was just like, oh my, yeah, I couldn't imagine doing that. I mean, right. having that level of success. I remember the day, like the, the, the morning before, of the day that I performed for the first time at the Delta Lady, and laying in bed, I was so terrified in the morning, and I was in bed thinking like, okay, I'm under the covers, like, no one can see me, but like in 12 hours, I'll be in front of an audience and everyone will be able to see me, and I was just terrified. And then, <laughs> and then it was a countdown. Yes, to get to terror. To... Yeah, but then, I, but then it all, I, I pulled it together. Well, when you it got your first couple laughs, is that when you knew, it's, I'm gonna... Yeah, you definitely, yeah, I got the juice. I mean, I, I, I'd gotten the first exposure for that, like, as a kid, um, because... Uh, Performing I, for classmates and... Yeah, and... It, it was, the, the choir did this thing where we did Yellow Bird and they wanted to have like a little fake band playing percussion and so we put on you know I put on like a straw hat and stuff and we all I don't know a few of us dressed in like Hawaiian shirts but I had this drum and for some reason I just started doing this like really goofy like dance when I was doing the drum and the place went crazy and so I just kept milking it and like sure. it kind of ruined the whole song and everything but uh but then like kids were coming after me up and going like Miss Hill was she was laughing so hard she was crying and that was the moment I got the juice of like okay I want to do this in my entire life. So really before Carson was Miss Hill. Yes, exactly. She she's it is directly her fault. Yeah. I'm doing what I'm doing now. <laughs> Let's be clear. Uh if there is a patient zero it's in fact Miss Hill. <laughs> um so now also your mother was not only supportive she uh, would drive you to hospitals and nursing homes to hone the act? Well, my magic act. Yes, that yes. came out for the stand-up. You decided I'm gonna... No, it was before. before. So, yes. Yeah, oh, great. I, yes, magic started very, very early. Like it did for Carson? Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, did you do magic? Because I think a lot I of comedians didn't. did. I started with the stand-up right in at the yeah, age so of were... 10, but I was lip-syncing Cosby's first album. Oh, there you go. Okay. Yeah, there was some, there was always something else. Yeah. You couldn't just actually write an act. No. That anyone would give a shit about it. Oh, no. So, and magic tricks were great because they came with patter. It was always terrible patter, but, like, you know, it, it gave you something to do on stage. Right. And then I just started putting jokes, and it was actually my dad was the one who, was, who said, like, you got to get some jokes, and he was a lover of comedy and he spent his whole you know half of first half of his life going to nightclubs and listen to the MC which I guess that was what the comedian was called sure. back then. and he would write down all their jokes so he had this big kind of 
treasure trove of all these old nightclub jokes. And uh, wow, yeah, and it was for when I was going to do I was going to do my magic act in uh, at the, the talent show in high school. And he's like, you gotta get some jokes. And so we pulled them out, and we found all the, we tailored all these jokes, but just like little, just jokes, you know. So yeah, kinda, joke jokes. Yeah, and that have uh, nothing to do with your trick. No, saying. zero, zero. But like something about it. But the, the very first joke was like about an elephant. It, they're all fairly rude jokes. Sure, let's hope. <laughs> yeah, exactly. About like an elephant. I don't remember the exact. I don't. I couldn't tell it today if you put a gun in my head. But it was something about a guy sees an elephant in a field and he's eating. The elephant is pulling a cabbage with his trunk and eating him. And so the guy, see, but he sees it in the, in the moonlight, uh, silhouetted against the moon. And so he runs to this woman's house and he says, uh, lady, there's an elephant in your garden. Well, what's he doing? He's pulling up cabbages with his tail. Well, what's he doing after that? And he says, lady, if I told you, you wouldn't believe me. I see. see? So she thought he was stuffing him up his ass. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. That was my father. <laughs> planted the... And all I remember is like telling that joke and there was like a weird like moment of nothing and then this weird like roar of laughter and it was mostly like teachers and dads like going like oh my god and that's kind of how they all and it got rolling and then and then I won the talent show well with visual jokes like that that make the audience think mm -hmm. if I may it's not just a stuffing cabbage up your ass elephant joke right um, I, I always uh, uh, sort of um, I don't know at a very early age I saw I saw something funny and then it was uh, wildly important to me in a, a geekdom fashion mm -hmm. to dissect and, and better understand. <laughs> Instead of just letting it wash over me, I wanted to instantly know why something was funny. Yeah. Uh, did, you have, did you have a sense for that at all or you just sort of... I think you naturally kind of get that. It's, it's how you... Curiosity? Yeah, I mean it's more trial and error I think for me it was like... You know, like, 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 my dad always liked shaggy dog stories. Which sure. Endlessly sure. long things. And he told one, and he told it really funny, I remember. It, but it kind of had this weird punchline. I don't know, it was very weird about, like, a guy, and, like, he's trying to do this stuff, and there's a guy who wants to get his break, and he wants to be something. I forget what it was. And he keeps trying, and it's this long, endless story about him getting, trying to get opportunities, trying to get opportunities. He finally gets the opportunity, and gets up, and the, the punchline was like, and he got up, and he couldn't do it at all. Or something like, some, you know, ridiculous thing. So I kind of was so empowered. I, I, we did a little presentation in our class where we had to do something and I go up and tell a joke. And I tell, I, it took like, it must have been 10 minutes. <laughs> and I hit that thing and it just like silence and the teacher's like, well, okay, see that's why, and she was all upset and kind of like, that, that's why you need to prepare things for this. You know, you can't just get it. Like, no, it was actually, I thought it was. So First of like, all, you can't beat a 10 minute joke. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know that today. Now, the reason I ask about the curiosity of why and deep constructing what makes something funny and what makes something work, through uh, the research that uh, our own Jason McIntyre was kind enough to provide me with, mm -hmm. I see your um, coming to terms with and now great appreciation for testing your films. Yes. And what that process has sort of become this incredible regiment um, mm -hmm. that you and Judd Apatow also sort of uh, uh, salute and, and, and are great practitioners. I was mm -hmm. hoping you could uh, share some of that. Yeah, well, I mean, honestly, Kevin, it's really, it's having come from the stand-up world, it's exactly the same as honing your act, you yeah. know, because without an audience, you, you can't do it. And, and uh, Will it play in Des Moines? Now? Yeah, exactly. And for me, what it is, I also, I, I know as any artist, if I may refer to myself as that. Please do. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, you get very precious about stuff very quickly. And so if I go through the whole 10 week DGA mandated time that I'm given to, you know, fine tune my film before I hand it into the studio, I love every single cut. I love every single moment. And just like, oh. And so Ten then, weeks, you fall in love with every aspect. Exactly. So then when they go, and it's usually, then you show to the studio, and then they do a test screening. So you're always sitting there like, oh, please, that audience. And then you're like, oh, well, they don't know. And, uh, they, they, don't, they don't know what's funny. They didn't spend 10 weeks with it. Yeah. How could they that? possibly know? Right. Those cretins. <laughs> how dare they not? They've seen it once. That's right. And so just out of, literally out of kind of self-preservation, I go, I started going like, okay, let's like two to three weeks in, you always have something that's in some kind of form where you're like, okay, yeah, I think stuff is kind of working and it's, and then just like show it then because then I haven't fallen in love with anything so then I go like oh yeah okay that didn't work take that out pull that out and then just every two weeks after that you do it 
A, because it, it's the only way you're going to know what, what is funny. And, and I actually cut out, I've now cut out um, friends and family screenings. Because usually what you do is, the first thing you do is you assemble all your friends and comedy Those professionals. It's the worst. It's the worst because you don't, get, you don't get any clear vision of what is working. Because we all laugh, we in the industry all laugh at stuff that's completely different from what the general public laughs at. Oh, yeah. I mean, I never forget the first uh, friends and family screening we did of Bridesmaids. You know, the very first scene where John Hamm's kind of trying to get her out of bed in the morning. Right. It was super mean. We had all these hilarious mean moments of Ham, and she's kind of like pretending he's not saying them. And, you know, and we just thought it was the fun. It just brought the house down. Sure. Because we're know. dark and sick. Yeah, exactly. So we get, so we're celebrating. It's like, oh my God, it's the greatest opening to the movie ever. We're so happy. Get in front of that first test audience and just zippo. I mean, just silence. And you go like, oh my God, people really like Kristen, and right. this is making her look pathetic. They don't mm -hmm. like him. They don't, you know. It's I was always, always felt bad. Like, you know, the funniest character actors always have to play villains in movies, mm -hmm. and they're funny villains. But like, the audience just hates them because they're villains, right. you know. But but they were all like, oh, that's so funny, and it just so it, it, it. I just had to get a system where it's just pure, you know, research. Yeah, it's very mathematical, and I think you know a lot of. Other you know filmmakers and stuff blanch at that of like oh you're just giving over to the audience but it's like if you're trying to make a commercial four quad movie you got to give over to the audience and I don't mind it either I'm, I don't pretend that I know you know we all again as standups you write that joke this is gonna kill and then like what and just dead yeah well this is the reason I asked uh, because through the research I sort of found this a fresh approach quite frankly to the test research um, process. Because the norm is to thumb your nose. In fact, I've been quoting Barry Levinson forever. When I did Avalon with him, mm -hmm. which was a very small sort of niche audience uh, film, mm -hmm. it was on the heels of all the massive studio success of Rain Man. Yeah. So much so that he was able to go into the studio with a three by five card from a test screening of Rain Man and present it to the studio that was funding Avalon and say, this is why you can't test Avalon. Mm. And on that 3 by 5 card, a person at the test screening of Rain Man wrote, hey, comma, why didn't the little guy just snap out of it? God. Yeah. So, and I've been celebrating and dining <laughs> off that because it's hilarious. Right. And it shows blah, 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 blah. But when I read through the research of yours, what you just explained about, it made sense for the first time as a comedian. Mm -hmm. I can think of something funny, but until an audience laughs exactly when and how and where I want them to, mm -hmm. it isn't funny. It's funny in a vacuum. Right. That is my head, mm -hmm. which as I explained at the top is uh, as narcissistic as <laughs> one's thoughts could be. <laughs> so yeah, I know what's funny. Just means I know what makes me laugh. Yeah, exactly. That that's really all it means. No, and, you know, and, and Judd really pioneered this. I mean, you know, it was working with him uh, on Bright. You know, I, I'd actually seen him doing it on all his movies. You know, from you know from the beginning, and um, yeah, and then it just suddenly made sense to me that it was like it, I don't think we are ever talked. He and I ever talked about how the fact of like, oh my God, this is it's totally the stand-up route. Like right. we're just doing it as stand-ups. But but yeah, it 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 works because again, I, you know, I. That's, it's, it's always so humbling that you always think you know what's going to kill. And I'm probably about 50% of the time. Well, you have right, instincts. You, know? yeah. you have instincts. And then the question is, can you get past them and really allow the audience to be yeah. a participant? The yeah. way that I was asking ours to be at the top of this show, the truth is, I really do want them involved. I'm mm -hmm. not just saying it to pay lip service or pander, both of which I'm wildly capable of. <laughs> it's genuine. Mm -hmm. uh, only through their involvement do things sort of improve to a place that they want it to be. Yeah. That's the thing. Yeah, and it just fine tunes everything. I mean, you know, for you know, I, we always like to have some kind of like little over the top scene. You know, I mean, the the, the perfect example was in Bridesmaids, the whole dress shop throwing up. And yeah, that was, sure. You know, we shoot everything, and then it was always kind of like, you know, Kristen was always very nervous about that scene, rightfully so. But you know, I remember, you know, Judd would always go like, look, we might use. All of it, we might have just vomit shit everywhere, or we might have none of it. We don't know, right. you know. And and then it was just interesting to always every screening, like let's put in too much. Okay, ooh, let's pull way back. Oh, you know what? We could have gone a little further. And just you know, nine screenings in, you're like, okay, I think we got the math right. And there's a scene in our the new movie I just did with Sandra Bullock and Melissa McCarthy about like a, a tracheotomy scene that was like we got the super gross version, we got the, the completely don't see anything, and found that math. But it, it is, it's so mathematical, but. Not in a sterile kind of like, oh, we're, you know, 
we're duping the public. It's more, I want to know too, because I don't, you know, I, I can enjoy anything because I did it. <laughs> so, you know, oh, look, look at how great that shot is. Oh, my goodness, linger on that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's why I was, I, I mean, the greatest lesson I ever had was um, I, the first movie I made, this thing called Life Sold Separately, that was like $30,000 out of pocket. Thank you very much. One Please. person is, it's, it, we call Thank it my, you. It's my party type. I uh, still own the VHS. <laughs> yeah, I know. Thank you, sir. Um, but I, I couldn't sell it any, I couldn't get any film festival, festivals or anything. And then I got the. Pen this, Gillette? Is that the one with Pen Gillette? Pen is in it, yes. Yeah. Pen is in it, yeah. And, um, and so I finally got this thing called uh, uh, Flix Tour, which was sponsored by Movie Line magazine, where they would fly each one. There was three of us that won. They'd fly us into a, the Midwest, rent us a car, and we'd drive from obscure college to obscure college by ourselves and show our movie. And it's the greatest thing. Every filmmaker should have to do this, because when you're in the editing room, it's like, oh, that shot where he's pulling up, and then he's walking. I can't cut into that. It's so pretty. Like, I want to see that. You know, it really, it is, well, it's okay to watch him walk all the way. And the minute you get it from an audience, it's like, oh, my God, <laughs> cut that off. Cut it off. What the fuck was I thinking? Why is he walking <laughs> right? the entire length of the property to get into that? Exactly. <laughs> so you have to be held accountable. It's so easy yes. in an editing room to go, like, oh, I'm so great. I'm, you know, this is, I'm such an artist. And you go, like, no, watch it like the fucking poor people who work hard jobs every day. That's why I can never get down on an audience. I mean, so many people. You know, oh, they watch these shitty shows. And blah, blah, blah. So, you know what? People, we're professionals. That's what we do. We deal with all that. People have jobs. They most people don't like their jobs. They got kids. They're tired. They just go. I just want to enjoy. I just want to laugh for half an hour. Can I just you want take to laugh me away job. from my life? Yeah. And like, how can I call somebody a shithead? You know, because well, you don't get what I'm trying to go for. You know, it's like no. They either think it's funny or they don't. And let's try to try to give them something that's good. Yeah. You know, don't give them shit. But at the same time. You know, let's let's you know, give them what they want. What an absurdly refreshing uh, take on uh, what it is we do. Um, so you, uh, uh, Judd, first brought Bridesmaid to your attention shortly after. Um, oh shit! I just totally blanked on the oh, name of the was, film. Oh, it was 2007. Um, first. Yeah, but his movie uh, just came Knocked out. Up. Thank you, Knocked Up. Uh, yeah. uh, yes, yes. Knocked Up had just come out, and it was around that time, which I found surprising that it had sort of been um, gestating since then, mm -hmm. and the way things come and go through the development process. Yeah. You guys met when you were stand-ups, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yep. Um, and what I loved about your uh, transition was something you said in a review, interview uh, when your worst year became your best year. Yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah, well, it was actually it goes back to Flix Tour, which mm -hmm. I was just talking about. Because when I was out driving around to these colleges that I'd never heard of, um, I always have to be writing. That's all about, even when I was an actor, and like whenever I'd be a regular on a show, I'd always like write an episode of the show. Like I just like to write. That's how I joined the Writers Guild. It was the first time I was. I think I was sixth lead on this sitcom, but it was enough, and I just wanted to pepper my role yeah. with a better storyline. So totally. I pitched an idea to Barry Kemp, one of the great TV Barry. guys who yes. did Coach, and and I think the second Newhart was Barry as well. Yeah, totally. Pitched him an idea, and he said, great, do you want to write that? And I said, yeah. Nice. Having no designs whatsoever on doing so, but <laughs> and then also not realizing that it was going to be rewritten within an inch of his life. And I think just the premise and the title stayed the same, and everything else was rewritten. But wow. I totally relate to, even when you're cast on a show, let me yeah. write an episode. Well, I had the idea of like you know, it's so easy to just sit around and waste time when you're an actor on a show, especially when you are the sixth lead. And you know, and I was always on generally on sitcoms, so you know, so you sit around a lot when you're not in the scene that's you know. There, but just the thought of you know, kind of, I don't know, playing darts or just watching TV was not good. So I would just write all the time. But um, you know, so so when I was out of this flick tour thing, I was like, I gotta write something, or I'm gonna go out of my mind. And my friend Matt Reeve had just co-created um, Felicity with J.J. Uh, Abrams, and I remember watching that and going like, oh, the hour long. I like the idea of an hour long mm. show. And so I'd always been wanting to write a high school thing, and I said, there's this kind of high school, and it kind of gave me some, you know some ideas. So I was like, I'm just gonna write this thing. And uh, yeah, and wrote it when I was out on the road. And you know, but the run up to that had been like the worst year of my life because, at least in my career, because I had taken all my money. I was a regular on uh, Sabrina the Teenage Witch. I'll say, it was Mr. Pool. Yes, and <laughs> and um, and so I, I, I was like, okay, I'm going to come back the next season. It's a hit. I'm finally on a hit show. I'm going to take all my money. I had about like thirty thousand bucks saved up from it, and and I made this this little movie. And then I couldn't sell it anywhere. 
no festivals would take it. Nobody would take it. Nowhere. So I just I had no money because then they after I'd finished it, they called up from Sabrina and said like, we're not gonna we're, we're writing out of the show. <laughs> you know, we don't know how to write for your characters. Well, I I do. I can write for it. And then right. they, so then I was like, no money, and I was just like, oh my god, I can't get this anywhere. And I you know was I decided I was gonna transition out of acting too because I didn't like the loss of control. You know, it was, it, you go like I'm finally a regular on a TV show. And then I get written out. Like I have no security whatsoever. Right. And uh, yeah. And if so, you have the, the interest and the desire and discipline to mm -hmm. write, my goodness. Yeah, it, it's hard. I mean, I still struggle every day with with the discipline to do it. It's the hardest thing in the world. I mean, and the internet's the worst thing that ever happened to writers. Yeah. It's like, oh, we check Twitter. You know. You know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> don't play the Simpsons tapped out game. Whatever you do. <laughs> oh boy! Don't even tell me about it. No, oh great! <laughs> I just discovered Vine, so that's oh, you're fucked. Another thing. <laughs> it's all over. <laughs> no, the public is fucked because they got to watch those six second gems that are coming out of me. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but then yeah, so I wrote that that thing while I was out on this tour, and then. So it's becoming the worst year ever at that point. Yeah, as you really bad. About. And then I write this pilot, and I when I get back to LA, I give it to my wife, who reads it and she loves it, and she's like, "You got to send this to Judd," because Judd had seen Life Sold Separately, and you know we were friends from way back anyway. And he was like, "I have, have this TV deal at DreamWorks. If you ever have anything you think you know would be good, let me know." And I held off for a long time because you don't want to. There's nothing worse than like doing a document dump on somebody. Yeah, the, the big uh, expression or cliche, uh, first impressions matter, mm -hmm. matter most, certainly the case. You got one shot at that first oh, impression. Oh, totally. Because I've had people do that to me, you know, sure. since, since things are going well. Like, oh, here's a script, and you, and you read it, and you go, like, this is the worst fucking thing. Like, did, did you did you take any, because my, now my impression of you is you're the worst writer in the world. Did you just kind of just shuffle something to me? Oh, I wrote this thing. Yeah. You know, so so I really waited for the thing. And um, when she read it and just loved it and said, you got to send this to Judd, I did, and then within 12 hours, he said, I'm buying it, Dreamers is going to buy it. And um, that and, was freaks and geeks. Yeah, and then suddenly we, I mean, NBC just happened to need a show like that. It was right after Welcome to the Dollhouse had come out, that movie. Uh -huh. And so I think they were trying to develop a show in that tone. And uh, ours came in, and they just threw all the other ones out and just said, you know, do it. Like, don't even, don't change anything even. You know, but then we went in and rewrote it a lot and got it to where it was, and then we found that guy over there. Is Sam Rogan behind me? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sam, could you move? <laughs> there he is. There. Come on. Right there. So when James Franco walks out to co-host the Academy Awards, um, <laughs> clearly with his thoughts and if not soul uh, elsewhere. Oh, bless his heart. <laughs> um, what are your, uh, do you think I created, uh, I helped to create and launch this particular genius I am a monster? Proud, I'm a proud father <laughs> proud of all of those, yes. those kids. Um, it really is remarkable, uh, but I'm at the cast that ultimately uh, came from the show, but I am therefore curious during the casting process, how remarkable and or normally difficult it was for you to fill these characters that many of which had come from your real life. That was one of the things I found interesting from the dossier was, you know, you weren't just writing something that was interesting to you. You were opening up your own personal experiences. We started with the Donald Duck um, beatings, as they're now being referred to henceforth. <laughs> but make a great movie. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, they were real for you as you were writing these characters and rewriting them. And the casting process, it wasn't until I was on the other side of it uh, that I could appreciate it as an actor, yeah. what my chances actually were before I came in the room and what decisions had already been made in, in the creator's yeah. mind, whether it's a film or a TV project. They've just got such a very specific um, entity totally. in mind from soup to nuts. So uh, I, I, was the process uh, sort of typical or? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was interesting because the instinct was to want to find the people who are exactly like the people I kind of had based the characters on. And some we did. I mean, Franco. I swear, he looks exactly like the guy that, that I wrote it about. And he acted, so that was, when he came in, I was just like, oh my God, it's, it's a, him. It's him. <laughs> yeah, and then with, down to with like his, the, his funny mouth and big teeth and all that, you know, so it was kind of like, oh my God. So I just, and he was, and, and then he was hilarious on top of it, but just, I couldn't get past that. Little did I know he was handsome. 
I was just going, oh my God, he's great. He's so goofy looking and everything. And then all of a sudden you find out these women are like, oh my God, he's the most. So I, I, I wasn't he's looking. James to, Dean. And yeah, exactly. I wasn't looking to cast a handsome guy. I wanted it to be all very real. But yeah, but he was so good. Um, but then, like, Siegel came in. Who was, and I, I couldn't, I didn't, when he first came in, I was like, he was, he was big and. He's gigantic. And, yeah, and, and like, and he was cool and he was like an athlete and stuff. And I was, I was like, ah, oh, he's not right at all. But then Judd really fixated on him. And, uh, and then it was, as we started going through the, the auditions, you go, like, oh, God, oh, yeah, he is great. He, you know, as the more you see him, the more you kind of purge the other image of who you wanted it, you know, who you wanted it to look like. Well, that's why I was curious. Well, that's what you have to do that, you know, and Judd was really good at kind of forcing me to do this because, you know, the, the, the instinct is to just kind of go, oh, oh, the God, they're so great, but they're not right, so get them out. And it's really what you have to do is you never, if somebody, if there's somebody you go like, oh my God, they're so great, grab them, hang on to them. If somebody's great, don't jettison them in, in you know, looking for something that doesn't matter to anybody else. And then you just adjust the parts to all of them. And so we, you know, like the Freaks didn't really have much in the, the original pilot I wrote. Uh, it was much more geek oriented. And then, you know, once we kind of found these guys, like, oh my God, they're so funny. And then they, they I started, you know, we started seeing the life that they could bring to these characters and then started tailoring it to them. And, and that's where good things come from because, you know, especially on a TV show, a movie's one thing. You kind of just have, you know, it's, it's a limited thing. But for a television show, you need, you need actors who are going to come in who are going to seed your creativity to go for hopefully eight, ten years, which, you know, which sadly we didn't. But, you know, you have to set it up for that. And so then you really, f you know, feed off of them. But, you know, we fed off the, the, the on-set politics, right, Sam? I mean, there was oh, stuff boy. going on. <laughs> Anytime they were, like, <laughs> those guys were in a, some kind of a battle about something, we'd always put in the script, or if Linda was having, you know, whatever with somebody. It, it, all, it all, you know, any kind of angst between the cast was great for us. We'd go like, oh, that's a great storyline. Dynamics. Can, yeah, we can play with that. And then, and then you, know, you know, I had this, this massive Bible I wrote for the for the series where I kind of felt like I knew where everything was going to go. And just immediately, even though you're writing scripts in advance, you start seeing them played out and you're like, oh my God, I, I don't want to go that route anymore. He, he, you know, like Seth's character, something was like, it'd be great if like he was from rich parents and whoever thought we would do that. But you go like, let's just like spend these, you know, take these turns because then it inspires us and then you're bringing their, you know, real personalities or their, you know, their real energy into it. And, uh, and then it just, it really, it's fun. It, and then you're almost like writing the show as a fan and kind of going, I wonder what's going to happen this week. Oh, what about this? It, it's fun to kind of surprise yourself that way. Right. If I may. Yeah, when Sam Levine walked into the office the ah. first time. <laughs> That's well From well your perspective, character. Sammy, <laughs> what was it like for you to walk into that audition? You were such a young man. Yeah, exactly. it was it was great. You know, eighteen, I mean, nineteen, he walked sixteen, in if I may. Yes, uh, sixteen years old. When it originally mm -hmm. read for uh, Sam Weir, uh, for casting for mm -hmm. Allison Jones casting, and uh, not a very particularly good audition, as I recall, but it was the it was the tacked on Shatner. Well, that's what that got you know, me they, back in the room. You went a that extra time. mile. Always go that extra mile. Yeah. Actors remember and that. And so then it was Judd who said, "Ah, this kid's not good, but look at that Shatner. Ah, Paul's going in to read the actors in New York. I'll put this kid on the callback list just so you can make Paul laugh." And then it was this genius sitting in your chair right there who said, "I want you to read for Neil instead." Uh, but to that end, Neil, if you recall, in the character description in the when you first meet him, it said a. Uh, an overweight, chubby kid with an underbite and a bowl haircut. Yes, yes. And so that remained in there, and we're shooting the pilot. <laughs> you know where this is going. We're shooting the pilot, and I point out to Paul, I was like, what is that in there? I, I'm none of those things. I have no underbite. I'm not fat, no bowl haircut. And so to appease me as a joke, the scene had already been shot. They issued new pages, and that line had been changed to something about the sexual energy is palpable. <laughs> This is a good-looking man. Exactly. And then the punchline is, they turned those scripts into books. And that love That's why we forgot to change that that it. Is in the why would book. we change it? Is, is it not true? Are you saying something? So if you own those books, feel free to look up Neil's original description the very there first is, time see? you meet him in the pilot. I originally thought he'd be like a De Niro and literally transform himself <laughs> physically into the show. would have let down that one. <laughs> Couldn't even get the bowl haircut. Nope. I know. That's, you know. Sorry. Yeah. Not method enough. Don't get I, didn't, I wasn't taking notes from Franco yet. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this, um... <laughs> 
Shatner impression to speak of. <laughs> ah, how delightful that must have been. Really, you, ask, you can ask anyone. It was. it was not an impression of Shatner. It was an impression of Kevin Pollack doing yeah. Shatner. That, it, I de get that, it definitely was that. Yeah, there's no question. With the hands. With the hands. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what door won't he open? <laughs> um, well, since we uh, mentioned the Mad Men thing, I'd like to jump around a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I I've found that all of your work, be it on TV or in your books or in your films, you've shown this affinity to characters trying to figure out their place in the world. Mm. So the idea that you would direct an episode in the first season of Mad Men, which is infiltrated with these wonderfully charming characters who appear to have control when, in fact, we find out that um, they're all paper tigers and mm -hmm. it, it's uh, riddled with um, losers, mm -hmm. if I may, <laughs> uh, but struggling or pretending they found their place mm -hmm. in the world. Uh, what was your sort of, uh, had, had you seen, I don't want to assume, you'd already been a fan of the show when you got the job. No, it, I mean, it was the, it was the first season, so, so I nothing got, had aired yet. No, I got sent the pilot, um, and I was in New York doing another show that I won't talk about because it was a great show, but I had a bad experience on it with one of the actors. Mm. A, and so I um, was like, I don't fucking, I'm not doing it. I was like, I'm no more TV. I don't want to do more TV. Right. And this is in 07? Yeah, yeah, it was. And, um, yeah, and I got sent that pilot, and I was watching it, going, oh, my God, this is really good. Uh, and I just, I, you know, the, the way I drive, I always wear a suit and tie and stuff, so I, like, I just immediately kind of just viscerally kind of latched onto it. Um, and then, uh, but I remember my funny, my takeaway from it was, God, I like that lead guy, but he seems like the most humorless man on the face of the earth. I remember thinking, like, oh my God, like, what a drag to work with him, because he just looked like, literally, he's devoid of any humor. And then I get to the set, and there's fucking ham walks out. And it's so unfair, by the way, that the Lord never gives with both hands. Yeah. And he gave with three hands with John. Oh had. my God. The and then it turns out a guy. fourth. As a limb has yeah. also so been attached. Oh boy, well, <laughs> yes, I have that too. <laughs> no, but, I know, right? Yeah, and he's like the greatest guy and the funniest man and the you know just the sweetest guy in the world. But but I, I kind of I, I think my the first I was like uh, no because you saying, just had this problem with other actors. Yeah, and I was like no, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. And then my agent was like, this is going to be like a big show. There's something about this show. She's the, my agent Renee Kurtz, who's now at CAA. Is I I credit her for so many good things that have in my career because she's forced me to go on shows I didn't want to go on. She forced me to go in the office, forced me to go on Arrested Development, forced me to go on Mad So it's like, it's crazy because I was like, I don't know, I don't, you know, it's just whatever, you get into your weird thing. Um, but uh, yeah, so, uh, so she kind of prevailed on me. I was like, okay, I'll do it. And went in and met with Matt Weiner, who you know was was a, a Freaks and Geeks fan, so that was nice. So we kind of had this mutual admiration society going. And although the, the irony, when I walked in, I always, you know, in my state, I always been wearing thin ties forever. I, I like I like that early '60s, late '50s style of suit. I have a bunch of them. So I walked in, and the receptionist immediately she goes like, "Oh, uh, casting's down the hall." I was like, oh, nice. I'm not here for casting. <laughs> I'm your director. How do you do? Uh, yeah, and, and then I just, you know, I really, I had a great time. It was a really fun time. But you know, I mean, Matt rules supreme over on that, on that show, and. But that, that's why I think the showrunners like working with me, and I and I enjoyed doing TV. Is that having co-run a show? Um, you know, we had great directors, but I'd always kind of prevail upon anybody. You know, they come like, oh, let's shoot this way, and they, you know, the ones who would kind of fight for a style, and I go like, no, that's not the style of the show. I don't want that. Right. You know, I got. It's a writer's drove medium. Drove them. Yeah. I, you know, I would drive these poor directors crazy sometimes. And but then my penance was like, okay, go on other shows, and I know show up with an idea, go like, here's how I think I'd like to do it. But if they go like, no, they go like, then don't go like, oh come on, you know, you know it's gonna look like a TV show. Every, that's always that was always the big thing with, you know, so many TV directors, in general. That was the, it's gonna look like a TV show, which I don't know what that means anymore <laughs> because TV looks great, but it was, this, it was this holdover from like the 70s when you know television did look kind of shitty, um, and or the 80s. Yeah, exactly. Just, you know, <laughs> but that kind of like, if the camera's not moving all the time. But then what happened throughout the 80s and 90s is the camera was moving all the time because all these TV directors were trying to make things look like movies. So then like when Jake Kasdan came 
on to do the pilot, you know, and I said, here's the style we want, this and this. He, he was like, this style's so cool, it looks just like a movie. <laughs> because he'd grown up watching TV looking like movies with all the moving cameras, and the fact that we'd slowed it down and, you know, just kind of made it more about the characters suddenly flipped that. So I always just found that interesting. But, but, but I guess the long-winded point being, you know, when you come in these shows, you really, you have to come in with invention, and then when they don't want it, you have to go like, great, what do you want? Because right. you know, there's nothing worse also than TV director goes like, well, what do you want? I don't know. You know, like with, with no plan whatsoever. Yeah. So, you know, you, you, you try to, you take, you know, you, you're lucky enough to go on shows that have good material and you know, good scripts and then all you try to do is elevate it higher. You yeah. Know? Well, there's an existing style. There's an existing tone. Yeah. Um, a reference. That pilot for Mad Men, arguably one of the best pilots. Oh and yeah. it, it's never the case. It's, it makes it even better. The pilot is rarely as good as the series ends up being yeah. because, as you pointed out, you've had a chance to get to know the cast and their energy that they've brought to the characters, which you had no reference when you were writing the pilot. Mm -hmm. So it's designed so that the pilot can never live up to. Yeah. Whereas with Mad Men, bizarrely, um, and not just because, spoiler alert, we find out he's married in the last few frames, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> which was absolutely yeah, breathtaking oh, and yeah. brilliant. It's not just that, you know, because that's, at the end of the day, a, perhaps a parlor trick. Mm -hmm. It's the structure and the design and, and the character flaws oh, yeah. and the time that seem, scenes get to uh, yeah. live. In that world, I mean, you just, you know, that hadn't really been portrayed on television for a long time. It, you know, it's almost aggressively slow. Yeah. You know, which, it, you, at first you're kind of like, well, because you're so used to stuff going so fast and everything. Was, I remember watching the pilot and going like, wow, what are, what are they doing? And having a moment of like, do I like this? And it's like, no, I kind of, I really dig this. This is actually cool. And there's and just that world and that production design. And, you know, and I remember, you know, Matt is obsessive about everything. I mean, we get this thing about hanger bags and, you know, which is great because I did the same thing on Freaks. It's like, you know, there's always this, you know, every, all these great people are working on stuff and they have their ideas, but they'll come in with stuff and, you know, somebody's got to guard, you know, the look and somebody's got to guard the, the entire feel of things because, you know, on our show is occasionally, you know, there's always like, this isn't that, sh that, that 70s show. Like, it, was, it takes place in the late 70s. Nobody wore, that I knew, wore a leisure suit. No, you know, there's no, there was maybe a couple kids with platform shoes, but wasn't, you know, they just, uh, so I'd bring in all my, like, yearbooks and go, like, here, this is what they look like, here, you know. And that's the same thing with Matt, and he would just obsess on, on these little, all the tiniest details. But I really admired that, too, even though sometimes you'd be like, oh, my God, you know. But, but, it, but it's, uh, it, it was good, you know. It was quite an experience, a really fun experience. And, and the cast was just the greatest. Yeah. So much fun. Uh, everywhere you turn. I mean, we've had so many of them here on the show, and Slattery to this day, oh, just... Uh, he's so great. I, and, and even this season, I just love how they just keep feeding him yeah. these beautiful throwaway one-liners mm. that he delivers like dialogue from a person and not a joke teller. And he's elegant. I mean, he really... He, you know, I think as the eras change, the costumes are either flattering or not flattering. Yes. But, but he always Somehow. looks like a million bucks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank goodness this year they gave him sideburns. <laughs> um, sit there wildly uncomfortable, if you wouldn't mind, while I sure. remind folks about our sponsor. Go right ahead. Yes. I uh, bet my sponsor, Ting, blows your mobile service provider out of the water. There I said it. Take it from a real betting man, you son of a bitch. Ting <laughs> is the future. Does your provider, for example, let you pick a custom service level from extra small to extra, extra large for voice minutes, whatever the hell that means? <laughs> Text messages and megabytes of data? Well, do they? Do you get consistently superior support without any overage fees, add-on charges, or penalties? Answer the questions. Ting offers all of this and more. No bullshit, no mysteries surrounding your phone bill, no sneaky fees, no frustration. Get services like hotspot, three-way calling, <laughs> call forwarding and voicemail included with your plan. Plus, add unlimited devices to a single plan to pool minutes and messages. It's a flat fee of just $6 a month per device. Are you fucking kidding me? Ting has it all. 
They're going to use this as their national campaign, by the way, <laughs> I right? can't see why not. I have to assume. <laughs> they say make it your own. What else am I going to do? This is how you talk in real so life. why not go to <laughs> chat.ting.com to save $25 on your new device and $25 in service credit. Do it now, you son of a bitch, to save big and support the show. Don't forget, that's chat.ting.com. A wonderful sponsor, and we love them dearly. Here, the fine folks. So switching today. <laughs> I ask you. Yeah, exactly. Make heads or tails, and then switch. <laughs> um, well, you've had uh, incredible success now directing TV. At least we forget the uh, mm. the Emmy you won for Goodbye Michael. Is that right? No, I got nominated. Nominated. I never won an Emmy yet. No. Um, nominated. A few oh, times. sorry. Uh, Directors Guild yes. for Dinner Party yeah. episode. That's why it stood out to me because I would assume. Uh, winning the Directors Guild Award, mm. forgive me, Emmy, mm -hmm. uh, as a director in a non-director medium, mm. to win that award from the DGA yeah. has got to be maybe the most impactful to you personally. That's, I think, the coolest thing that's ever happened to me. I yeah. remember that night just going, like, like hearing it, like you know, you don't expect to win. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, really? Yeah. Oh, it, it, you know, because it's your peer group, and you know, the, it, also I'm just wildly proud of that episode. That that's. It was a very divisive episode. Too, Dinner party. When it first, yeah, when it first aired. Right. Like a lot of, you know, because I was around, you know, I was working in the office a lot, and like the reaction wasn't what we thought it was going to be because we just, we all loved it. And just like people were just like so put off because it's so uncomfortable. But that's my favorite thing. The more you squirm, <laughs> the funnier it is. Yeah. To me personally. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, just in life in general. <laughs> was that the one uh, under the tent with Stephen Collins? Is this the one I'm thinking of? Which was the dinner party? Oh, it's where um, basically uh, uh, Michael invites Pam and Jim, and then uh, uh, you know Ed Helms and, and Angela over to his condo. All right. As his marriage is falling, or his you know, he and his girlfriend are breaking <laughs> up. And yes, it's, it's, and the big screen TV. <laughs> oh my God, it's well. <laughs> that that little sequence is one of my favorite things in the world with the giant screen and it's like this twelve-inch thing, and then he built this table that's super shitty, and it's just it's the I don't know I I, I couldn't be prouder of that because just the, the way everybody worked on that and we, the way we timed the reveals of stuff it was um, I'm very 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 proud of that one. Well, I would think with all the work you've done on the office over the years, um, another uh, huge. Uh, personal thrill or achievement would be well, most impactful if you were a fan of the British show. Mm. Well, now you've got yeah. this insane hurdle to overcome, just personally, because the American audience as a whole had never seen the British version. Again, that's an isolated uh, or insulated show business reference or mm. point of view um, that we're all so painfully familiar with the British yeah. version, yeah. which was um, reinventing the wheel in so many ways. So now you've got to tackle it for your own, mm. um, uh, not just um, creative path, but if you were a fan of the British version, you're painfully aware, if not acutely, yeah. of that uh, challenge that's been laid at your feet. Yeah. How do you process something like that? Do you just remove it? Well, it was, I mean, it was interesting because I like, I think, Several people, you know, again, we're in the comedy community, so we all fixate on this stuff. You know, we knew the original show, right? And it's so good. And then they made this weird decision, which I'd heard actually Ricky, I think Ricky wanted them to do it, that the pilot had to be exactly the same script as the British pilot was. Right. And so that really threw me when I watched it because I'm a, I was a huge, I mean, such a huge fan of Carell's from The Daily Show. And right. I remember, I couldn't, I, in retrospect, when I heard. Behind the scenes, how hard it was to find who was going to play the character. I was such a fan of Carell when they announced it. I was literally like, "Well, of course, who else would play it?" But I guess they went through a hole, Michigan, to try to get him. But um, but but watching that pilot, I was kind of like, mm, "I don't know." And I stopped watching it. And then that was when my agent called up. It was the beginning. Of, they only did six in that first right. season, and then it was the beginning of the actual first full season when she said they wanted me to direct some. And I was like, "I don't know." But then. She said, "Well, watch the other ones, you know." And so I watched it, and then they're hilarious because then they then they make them their own. I mean, Greg Daniels is a genius. Yeah, he's, for he sure. is one of the people I admire the most in this town, because you know he's of the he, the way he does stuff is, he really deputizes everybody who works for him to call him on anything. You know, he hires a writer's room filled with young people, but with you know with older writers too. And so you get a good mix of, of everyone. And then it's not. Then everyone can call call him on anything. And you know, I've been in that writers' room a lot. 
and they do. They'll, they'll call bullshit on anything, and his whole thing is like, okay, challenge me, but if I say no, or then drop it. But, but by doing that, everything, you know, the, the quality goes up yeah. because you're challenging stuff. There's nothing worse, you know, this business is just nothing worse than, you know, don't tell me, don't tell me, don't take, you know, people don't take notes. Nobody's that smart. Nobody's that good. You know, I, Shakespeare took notes. I know everyone, he would, you know, they would workshop as they were doing the thing. It's not, you know, it's, you know, you need input from people. Let me just make this note yeah. to Aaron Sorkin. <laughs> Shakespeare took notes. So, seriously, what the fuck? Speaking of The Office, I don't know if our viewers have caught up on the most recent episodes, no. but uh, Mr. Paul Feig makes it finally, after all an these on years, camera? an on yes, camera, I finally appear on camera. Very funny appearance. Thank you very much. Which was greatly enjoyed by the entire Levine family. Oh, ah, perfect. So we that's all em. you need, really. Got the Levines. Yeah. Nice. Thank You're you. Talking about Max, Harris, and Lynn. That's them. Ah, uh -huh. I can right. name them now. <laughs> <laughs> after dinner the other night, I can. Isn't now... that the settings on the air conditioning and the uh, Max <laughs> and Harris? <laughs> 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 Oh, yeah. hi, hi, Max and Norm. I'm sorry. Those are the, the, the three Jews who invented car air conditioning. Hi. That's an old Max Billy Reback joke, too. I'm not going to take wow. responsibility. Is it a Billy Reback joke? Yes, yeah. That's fantastic. Isn't that the greatest? Yeah. yeah. Hi, Max and Norm. Or hi, me and my family. Ah. Uh, um, but, yeah, but so, so the office, I mean, so it was, it was, um, it was just fun to get in there because they had kind of done the heavy lifting because when I watch those other episodes from the first season, you go like, okay, wow, that's really funny. And so then we, we cut to Goodbye Michael episode, which although merely nominated, forgive me, um, for an Emmy, <laughs> um, having gone through that initial uh, welcome to the party and, and the ob biggest obstacle of all that he had to fill those shoes mm. um, played to historical Brilliance by Ricky Gervais. Mm. Uh, when you're directing that episode, Goodbye Michael, mm. how do you uh, not well, not weep the entire time? Well, I mean that. Well, that was the big thing on that, and, and um, Steve Carell leaving the office is a devastating event for everybody because he's the nicest man in the world. Michael Scott leaving. The paper company is not that emotional of a thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Beautifully put. Yeah. And so we had to really consciously How do you separate, fight. Though? Yeah, and go like, no, so and so, they would not be, they'd still be bugged by him. They'd, somebody might feel kind of weird about it, but other people wouldn't. And so it was really, it was almost like you had to, like, okay, get it out of your system, folks, because we're you know, it still, it has, still has to be funny. And uh, it, was, it was a very, very odd week. Was there a time during the week? where you sort of had to individually tackle this demon of separating the two for the co-stars? Oh, yeah. Like, was, did everyone have a different day where they were falling apart and yeah, therefore it, you had it every day? Yo, yeah, it was, it was cause every, but every single thing. I mean, like, the first thing we did was, I mean, the first thing we shot was all of his talking heads. We're all good. And, and it was like this thing where it, it was just, you know, kind of the core team of myself and Greg, and, you know, and, 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 and Steve. And as we were getting to the like the last ones, remember I could feel it's all go like we're about to do Steve's last talking head ever, and we all felt it. And I remember I think we might have even mentioned kind of a few before, and then as soon as we finished it, no, we, none of us said anything. We were just kind of like, okay, we got it. All right, cool. Let's go on to the next thing. Right. And it just this, we just just the, the desire to go like let's not make a big moment out of this because we all realized if we literally go like this is the last time we'll do this, the last time we we'll do this, we're just gonna be devastated the entire time yeah but so it, so every time you know one of the characters would be coming in for their final scene with him it would be so emotional but you had to kind of get it out okay and just you know so if anything i was just the the mean guy who was going to ring like okay yeah not so you know, like you don't care you don't care it's you know and uh stop caring yeah exactly and i remember the just the, you know the very last well it was weird because the very last thing that we shot thank you mm -hmm. you kind um with everybody was the, the final um, conference room scene. Yes. Yeah. And so that was kind of devastating. But then, oh wait, no, I, I'm getting it all wrong. Because uh, um, I was thinking that airport when, when she you know, says goodbye to him, that we actually shot, that was the day before the last day. All right. Because that was, I thought that was going to be the one where I really fall apart, but then you're like, well, no, we still have another day of shooting. <laughs> but just, but then directorially, then I, then I had to go like, no, this is the one I have to make kind of really resonate, you know, just how we, how we kind of stage it and all that. And it, and it was, 
you know, taking off the mic and all that. And I think, I think I actually that probably got me more choked up at that moment because everything, I don't, I've never been a fan in, in, in anything I do. I don't like obvious emotion. I don't like, Good. Yeah, I don't like make, making people cry because you do something <clears throat> sad. I like to make people cry because they're feeling so happy. Like that to me is like the greatest thing. And I think it was too fish in the barrel to go like, okay, the last shot, of course, we're all going to fall apart. But it was just more just the idea of like this is his final shot in as Michael in the show, and right. so then I got all like, oh, you know, taking off the mic, choked up, yeah, yeah, and just watching him walk away. We always had him walk endlessly away, just in case they wanted to, you know, have two minutes of him walking. <laughs> that long shot of of the actor walking, you do want. Yeah, that 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 I like. <laughs> that I like. The driveway shot. Milking. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and then he enters the house. Um, <laughs> let's uh, go to our fine audience uh, who Uh-oh. likes to write in questions for the guest. Oh, I hope they're not too snarky. I know. Well, <laughs> Jamie does a wonderful job of removing the snark. Oh, very good. So these should be snark-free. Oh, excellent. Uh, not as that well I'm as, a fan of snark, though. I'm as bringing... well as gluten-free. Oh, thank um, God. This one is, uh, <laughs> a, 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 don't you know, a Tweet 5. T5, T5, T5 forever now. Thank you, Dave Keckner, and all your craziness. <laughs> This comes to you from the Twitterverse, uh, specifically at Keen Anvil. Again, these are Coke or Pepsi, this or that. No correct answer, and yet, we'll see how you do. Oh, boy. Better band name, Creation or Anarchy's Child? (laughs) I go with Creation. Yeah. Mm. Better robot costume, Gort or the Bionic Woman? Gort. Better audition song, Crossroads or Sunshine of Your Love? Crossroads. Better for picking up the ladies, Parisian night suit or feathered hair? <laughs> Parisian night suit. Hello. <laughs> Better no D&D character name, Craigamore the Destroyer or Carlos the Dwarf? Carlos the Dwarf. What are we talking How about? How dare you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Had to, had to bail on you on that one. Too. That's all right. You That's got right. five out of five. Right. I did. Ah. <laughs> what do I win? Soul exactly. kiss from Sam Levine. Exactly. Exactly. Nice. What do you win? <laughs> um, so th- I found something interesting also about the Freaks and Geek thing was, you know, as someone who, who created this world and then he co-ran the show and um, saw it uh, mature and live and breathe, uh, only to have its uh, dear sweet life snuffed prematurely uh, mm-hmm. by an, uh, just a genius of a network <laughs> who succeeds wildly to this day. Nope. Um, <laughs> taking all of that from a personal standpoint, when people have come up over the years to say, I tried to get people to watch that. Right. All those ass backward fucking compliments right. that we in the creative community right. just can't live without. Right. Exactly. When something like Time Magazine's 100 Greatest Show acknowledgement comes along, finally, are you able to at least enjoy that? Yeah, you know what? I, I, I try to enjoy everything. I mean, it, you know, the, the show get, getting pulled was, you know, it was devastating for all of us because... Of course. You know, it, it literally, like, you're so in love with these, not only just the actors themselves, but then the characters they're playing, and you have so many long-term plans for them. But, but really it was more... The assumption is you take satisfaction in all the years later when it becomes a so-called cult following yeah. and people go crazy for it and complain and give you those ass or compliments of how hard they tried to get their stupid friends to watch it. Yeah. But you can't personally enjoy those ass or compliments because you still have the memory. Yeah. And no one, by the way, wants to be told they're a cult success. Sorry, no. there I said it. I know. No, it's true. It's very true. Yeah. So was there? are there moments of personal satisfaction when it not only just won't go away, but continues to be celebrated. It's, it's what you always want when you work in recorded medium. Well, let's say it ran six years successfully and ended when you wanted it to, mm. and you got all of these accolades all these years later. Right. It's the same incredible accolades. Let's forget whether it was one season or six. Yeah. You got the end result all these years later, which is, mm. oh, you're the guy yeah, who yeah, exactly. created that magical land that I got to live in. Right. I mean, it would have look, it would have been great had that happened. There are times, I mean, I think, I mean, kind of not too far after we got canceled, I remember marveling at the fact that they sort of let us do as many as we as we did, and what was great is that we didn't compromise any of them. Marveled only because there weren't enough numbers? Yeah, that we were so low rated. But that's rated. the only reason it's a marvel. 
Well, I mean, it was also... Because you were succeeding at what you were trying to do. Yeah, but we weren't... Crowd-pleasing was the problem. If I may, also succeeding at what you wanted to do. Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, exactly. you hadn't yet created the, the awareness of yeah. how do we involve the audience and test and get to know their taste. Yeah. So you started in sort of a creative bliss, which is yeah. you pick up a phone, you make a call, 12 hours later, the damn thing's greenlit, the next thing you oh, know, totally. you're casting. Yeah. All that's fantastic. You have this creative freedom mm -hmm. to do uh, as you will. Mm -hmm. The numbers don't come, no one can control that aspect. Right. But you you got to uh, thrive yeah. in the creative freedom. Yeah, yeah, and then, so I, 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 I take a lot of, I mean, that was a good thing. That that was very satisfying. It has to be. Yeah. Oh no, totally. The bad the bad period was sort of the f personally was the four years between the cancellation of the show and the DVDs coming out because what happened was you know Judd did uh, um, undeclared and then just started you know that was so kind of well thought of too that what happened was it was maybe like I kind of got written out of history a little bit which was. A little bit of a shock. So you have a show that nobody's, that all, people only remember because right. it doesn't exist. Right. You know, and so it's like, oh, yeah. So you hear a lot of like, oh, I heard that was good. And it's like, mm -hmm. or so, just Judd Apatow's freaks. And well, geeks. then there'd be that, which you know, and Judd, I, he deserves everything. Yeah, he's fantastic. But at the same time, you're kind of like, that was my one thing, you know, kind of. Like, <laughs> yeah. Because it, it, it ended. And you go. Like, there, there was this moment of like ending where it's kind of. I remember when I was in film school and I'd watch this. Uh, it's a Wonderful Life, and I go like, if I could just do one of those, <laughs> and that like, it's all I ever, ever remembered for. I would be so happy. And so it was kind of like that was the solace I took when we got canceled. Like. At least I did it. People who loved it loved it. The critics loved it. At least I got that. And then suddenly it's like, hey, wait, I, no, I, you know. And suddenly it was like, you know, I was We're completely gone. Yeah. And it was like, oh God, it was so hard. Um, but but let's, you know, it's important not to brush over that. That that sort of setback, quite frankly, is I believe what made those four years one of the main factors that made those four years difficult. Your friend um, and colleague grandfathers this thing in and then becomes your partner in the show. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why you're giving him all the credit, credit deserved, yeah, yeah. credit earned. Oh, yeah. But at the same time, it should never be anything less than uh, co between the two of you. So when yeah. the, the, the message spreads, mm -hmm. this is another fine example of Judd Apatow's brilliance, mm -hmm. and you're not involved in that. Right. <sighs> well, I mean, how do you do not de develop this bitter pill that I know you try to fight I mean it, it just becomes you just you know <laughs> John would even call me occasionally go like he goes I think you're going crazy <laughs> because like you you're, you you know a lot of like calling newspapers having them run corrections and at a certain point you just say like, I can't do that anymore it, it, <laughs> you just I just don't want to get written out of history was the only thing that's so right kind of that's like, right because you know, I mean his it, you know he without him the show would I always say like it, without him, the show wouldn't have existed without me. It wouldn't have existed. You know, but that's the point, right? Exactly. So, so you had every reason to call newspapers yeah. for a while until Judd called you. But then and it said, just becomes doing yeah. That. But then it just becomes a mania at some point. You go like, God, am I just going to be the fucking loser who's doing this all the time? So, and that's just why just for four years. Yeah. It, well, <laughs> but the, 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 here's the irony: was we were we kept getting approached by companies companies that wanted to put it out on DVD, but they were always saying like. But we can't afford the music, so we'd have to change all the music. It's like as much as I want it out, it's like I can't, I can't put it out with the different with different music. It's just everything was tailored to that music. I mean, I would write specifically to songs, and you know, and how so did you get around that eventually? We if Judd finally got contacted by Shout Factory, who you know we made our standard speech about not changing the music, and these and then they were like, and these idiots said fine. Yeah, they're like fine, <laughs> fine, we want to do it, yeah. and, and I mean it was a million dollars worth of clearances they've done. I think they've made a gazillion dollars off of it, which, thank God. Yeah. Um, so that well, was such a relief. Well, it's the reason um, The Wonder Years was kept off syndication forever. Oh, yeah. Well, because I remember when they put out the, the Andy Griffith show, and like the, the opening theme song was different. You're like, what? You know, <laughs> so you can't, you can't do that. It just, it's just like, you know, it's like killing a character in the middle of the show, you know, like... WKRP is another good example. Mike always... Ramen always mentions that, and that's true, too. The music was really important to that show, and then if you watch the yeah. DVDs, they take out all the music. Well, we mentioned Carson coming through the curtain. If you don't have yeah. <laughs> Ed Shaughnessy oh, striking it up with that drum first. Totally. Forget about it. Yeah. So it is just not worth, you know, it's, you know, 
the artist in you cares too much about having it out there. But then the, once it came out, then it was great. Then it's like, oh, thank God, you know, then. Then history was written. History was written. To the victor. Yeah. <laughs> called the <spot. laughs> But I mean, but, but Judd is the greatest. I mean, I don't want anybody to think that I'm. Well, no, I, I want to be. Was, it was more anger at the media. Sure. For going, yeah, like, let's Come be on, guys, clear. Check your fucking facts. This wasn't a campaign driven by Judd in any way, <laughs> no, shape, or form. Not. I'm sure he felt horrible. Oh, no, totally. He would always yeah. say, I'm sorry they keep doing this. Yeah. Thing. And also was friend enough to call you and say, you need to relax your crack a little bit. I know, because it was... now it's becoming manic, it was which crazy. is a true friend, because you are lost in the mire of it. How the fuck yeah. can you not be? Yeah, oh, no, totally. And in terms of the It's a Wonderful Life reference, in case anybody was wondering, that film did not do well when yeah. it came out. Mm -hmm. It's one of the most perfect films ever made, in my humble opinion, mm -hmm. from beginning to end, story-wise, performance, direction, in mm -hmm. every possible facet. And mm -hmm. the public said, nah. Yeah, no bringing, bringing up baby the same way. Yeah, One of the greatest comedies of all time. And people didn't like her, and so they didn't like that movie. And it's just like, come on, people. Yeah, Pull come on, people now, people now, people now. <laughs> uh, t uh, sit there again, uncomfortably, if you wouldn't mind, yes. because we have a second sponsor. I'm just going to say it, Tonks. There they are. Savvy, how do you feel, Tonks? Tonks for the coffee. Does it roll uh, off the, the coffee? Tongue? Tonks. Tonks for the coffee. Every time. Uh, tonks. Every, whenever I hear Tonks, I think of Tonk. Look in the, in the tonk. tonk. Look in the Tonk. Um, hey, folks. Do you enjoy your fancy coffee? Yes. I myself am a bit of a coffee snob. You need to know about Tonks coffee. Tonks is a small, tight-knit <coughs> team of coffee experts whose mission is to provide their subscribers mm, 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 with the greatest coffee in the world. Sign up to receive freshly roasted Tonks beans and brew right in your own damn kitchen. Tonks is a delivery service bringing delicious coffee right to your front door 24 hours after roasting. Imagine that kind of fresh coffee every day for the rest of your days. It's not a pipe dream. All right? Get out of the pipe. Stop dreaming. You can get fresh beans like this anytime you want using Tonks. Pre-ground coffee is only a desperate last resort. Just so you know, great coffee has very little to do with fancy gadgets and flashy gizmos. Don't blow your wad, as it were, on an expensive machine when you can simply brew at home. Tonks handpicks the farmers they source their beans from. They're obsessed with the perfect roasting of each bean, maximizing balance and sweetness. Give me a slice, friend. Mm. Mama. Get a new shipment of coffee beans from a different region every two weeks, if you desire. Sample coffee right from around the globe anytime without getting out of your robe. You see what I did? So why not try it out? You obviously deserve a great start to your day with a hefty bonus from the show. Get a free sample using the URL tonks.org slash coffee. See what you've been missing. That's tonks, T-O-N-X dot org slash P-O-L-L-A-K for a free sample of some of the best coffee beans in the world. Speaking of which, Kristen Wiig, how's that for a segue? <laughs> Pretty good. Um, everyone knows her from Saturday Night Live. We mentioned that around 07 when... Um, knocked Up. Thank you, Knocked Up. Hit the scene, Judd mentions to you, oh, by the way, there's this thing, Bridesmaids, and um, you go to a table read, mm -hmm. I believe. But there were a couple of directors in the running, as it were, mm -hmm. at that point. And were you a fan of Kristen Wiig's uh, from Saturday Night Live at that point? Yes. I say so. You were well aware of just how brilliant she was as a sketch actress. Yes. But as I recall, you were also somehow involved in her first acting. Her first movie. Movie. I cast her in the first movie she was ever in. A little gem we like to call Unaccompanied Minors. <laughs> Thank you. I own that on VHS. Thank you very much. Yeah. It's all the I only also... VHS copy. No, very... <laughs> Weird that you would still have that. That's... I don't know why I have Well, you, you hang on to formats. I know <laughs> that. <laughs> I, uh... I have the beta copy. <laughs> That's right. Uh, yeah, and I had hired her. She had just started on SNL, and um, I, to a point where she hadn't even kind of made an impact yet. But Allison Jones, the amazing Allison Jones, our Emmy award-winning Allison Jones, here, here, mm -hmm. um, said, "Oh, you, you should hire Kristen for this thing." It was like it was like a two-line part. And I was like, "Oh yeah, I like her. I've seen her," and she came in and she was just so great and you know and, and cute and funny and, and everything. But real actress chops. Oh totally. Oh my God, totally. And this was a you know thankless part. She was like the kind of go back to strippers. She was the stripper mom. Of, that was the backstory we had. We didn't say it because it was a kids movie, but uh, of one of the kids. And so she kind of was all you know in a little short skirt and everything. And she was just funny. She was ad libbing all this hilarious stuff that of course we didn't use because that was the old Paul Feig. <laughs> uh, <laughs> How dare you bring your brilliance yeah, to the yeah, table? 
Exactly. Yeah, I'll deal with you soon. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so she was great. And then, um, yeah, then I got asked to, to this table read, and it wasn't even called Bridesmaids back then. I forget what it was called. I think they were, it was called Honored or something like that. Um, and it was really, I really liked it a lot. And the irony was Melissa McCarthy was at that table read portraying a different character. She was reading just, I don't remember what part she was reading. She didn't read that one. Um, and, and, the, and the part that she ended up playing was also written quite differently than the way she played it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she, yeah, exactly. She, it was written more for kind of like just a weirdo. Anxious. Yeah, yeah, like an uptight, oddball. Right. Um, yeah, and then she just came in with that crazy take on it. But but the table read was interesting, and it was it was you go like there's something here, and I've been dying to work with like a project with women because I, I really love working with women. I find I don't know I find funny women to be the greatest thing in the world, and um, and so we, you know we gave them a lot of notes and thoughts and stuff, and then um, I was kind of busy on something, and, and, and you know I said you know let me know once they're rewriting, and if it goes, please I want to be in the, the running for this, and then it just kind of disappeared. Uh, for a while. For a while. Oh no, totally. It was just. I think Kristen got busy, you know, with SNL, Being so she wasn't able. To, yeah, exactly. She wasn't <laughs> able to rewrite, and then the studio stepped away. And they, I, there's a lot of stuff. I don't even kind of know why it came back when it did. I'll tell you why. That time was so needed and mm. so perfect for her to mature, which mm. is everything. Yeah. Um, and to get and, that following that she had. And to get that following. Yeah. To allow someone with the money to relax their crack a little bit, mm -hmm. even though her name on a poster is not guaranteeing you yeah. 3,500 screens. Mm -hmm. um, also to allow you to uh, mature mm -hmm. without question, yeah. right? I mean, Very those sort sense. of setbacks are important to acknowledge in terms of, thank God, yeah. all those years later, yeah. you were forced to wait. Totally. No, it, it, it's so true, because you know when I did an un Uncompany Minors, you know, I, I, I did that movie you know, a lot, Basically, the kind of the same process I do. We did a lot of ad living with the kids and improv and all that stuff. But you know, but at the same time, it just I wasn't. I don't know. I, I still hadn't. I wasn't kind of prepared. I don't think to do bridesmaids at that point. Um, but it's important for those of us who are sort of raised on hustle, 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 but also don't give up when yeah. something gets delayed or slowed down or the process mm -hmm. takes longer than we all want it yeah. to. Just know that that is the process. Oh, total. No, it, 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 that is the thing, because you get so, in this business, you're just like, I got to get the next thing, I got to the next thing. I mean, same like with After Bridesmaids, it was just like, I got to do a movie right away, I had a successful movie, I got to do another one. But then at the same time, you're like, no, but if I do a shitty one or I do the wrong one, that's right. then it's going to just erase all the good stuff from that. And, and so kind of waited a long time and then finally found this one that was the perfect follow-up, I feel. Um, but so I, I'm a big believer in that, too. And it, for me, TV was... You know, I, ten solid years of TV directing was was the best thing that could happen to me because it was you know I'd gone to film school, I'd done all that stuff, but that was where I really learned a lot because you're going into different genres, so you're you're really you're you're learning how to be ready for anything. I mean, Arrested Development, I I, I just my I just became so much of a better director politically from that because you would get scripts at the last minute. I mean, at the last minute, sometimes the morning of. Jesus. And and I used to be very prep heavy, like oh, the things that all, and it just taught me like you can't, you just you just got to go with it. And ever since then, like I, it, I, I'm really good at kind of just going like here it is, envisioning it and like figuring it out. I actually kind of prepare. I actually prefer that because depending on what kind of thing, too much prep makes you lose touch with the lightning in a bottle stuff that's going on on, on on the set. And if you come in with, you know, I used to get screwed, kind of like, oh, I can't, we can't go off this because I need this shot. And it's like, no, fuck it. Who cares about that stuff? Something's happening here. Let's immediately re, you know, jigger the way we're thinking about this to get that, to get that energy. And let's throw that other thing out. And that's, you know, that, if, if comedy directing is nothing else, it is capturing lightning in a bottle. That's yeah. what you have to do. And that's why I like cross shooting everything, you know, because if I can get you and I on camera at the same time and you surprise me with something, my reaction, I'm never going to be able to replicate my reaction or my kind of in the moment throwing back to you. And, you know, it's, it's just why I love recorded medium versus theater or whatever, which I love going to theater, but I would have a, it'd be less fun for me because I love trying to go, like, get something to happen once and it happens, you're like, oh my God, we got it. And yeah. that's the greatest feeling in the world that you capture something that you know, may never happen again.
Right. You know, then an audience watches it over and over, and to them it becomes gospel. And like, of course, how could that not exist? And you know, but you go like, no, that was something that the person didn't even know they did, or they, you know, they didn't weren't realize that this, it, you know, came out of a surprise. And that's just, I mean, that's that's the greatest feeling in the world. Right. And then when the success of Bridesmaid, Bridesmaid explodes on the scene, and you end up having an Academy Award nomination in the case. Of, uh, yeah, for the Melissa, script and for, and Melissa, for the yeah. screenplay for yeah. Kristen and, and her partner Annie um, Mumolo. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, now we're talking about uh, a new playing field, and you mentioned briefly, how soon do I follow it? What do I follow it with? Um, unfortunately, that's part and parcel of uh, trying to live in the present, mm -hmm. but it's impossible with this business or most. Certainly this one. Yeah. What have you done lately and what do you follow it with? And I found at some point, it seemed to me mm. that everything I was working on, at some point it wasn't about that, it was about how it affects the next thing. Oh God, totally. Well, you know, you know, that's the problem with this town. It was just we're, we're surrounded by it. You know, you can't, you know, back in, you know, either pick up Variety or Hollywood Reporter and now Deadline Holly, you know, it's in your face constantly. And so it's this thing of like, someone's always making a deal. Someone's always getting something. Someone's always starting something up. And as a director, you always, I'm always going like, wait, didn't he just do a movie? Like, oh my God, he's just going movie to movie to movie. And you're like, fuck, I got to do that. <laughs> you know, but I find the more power, you know, the two biggest questions are, what have you done lately? And then, but then the other one is it's not a question so much as like you're only as good as your last project, and that trumps what have you done lately every time. Sure, because if you you know nobody gives a shit why or how fast you did it. If it's not good, it's not as good as the last thing, then boom, you know down you go. I mean, and this is coming from a guy who was in movie jail. I mean, I was hardcore locked in movie jail after um, on a company minors. It just it didn't make enough money, and but uh, that's happened to a lot of people. Oh God, totally. I mean. Ben Affleck's entire career was in jail. Yeah, oh, that's the thing. But like you say, just it persevere. You just, you know, the spoiled to the, you know, whoever stays in the game longest wins, you know. So in the case of Bridesmaids, you mentioned you did take some time to figure out the best thing to do next. Yeah. Um, I have to assume there were a couple of moments of either weakness or maybe even false starts where something did seem like the next thing was perfect. Yeah. Before you did. Well, I um, heat, which comes out June June twenty eighth. Twenty eighth. Be there. Um, I I signed on before Bridesmaids came out to do a sequel to Bridget Jones, uh, Diary, and which I was just like, oh my god, this is the greatest. You know, I I loved the first one, and I didn't like the second one at all. So I was like, I want to bring it back to that. You know, and all these reasons. But then when the movie hit, it was this kind of thing like, oh, okay, you know, should I still be doing a sequel? But I really liked it. So I, had, I, I moved to, I, lived, I was living in London for I mean, four or five months, prepping that. We were just rewriting it constantly. But um, it, just, it just never was, the, the, I don't know, the planets weren't aligning with it. We couldn't get, you know, certain actors didn't like things we were doing. And so we were trying to rejigger with them. And then Helen Fielding wasn't in liking what I was wanting to do. You know, it was all it was all standard kind of, you know, showbiz creativity, which is fine. But it just I just felt this thing of like something is off. Something's not happening with this. And and so I ended up kind of, you know, stepping away from that project. And that was after months of, of being Half there. Half a year practically. Yeah, life. yeah, it really was. And and then then I finished. Then I went, dove right into this script that I wrote for, um, you know, for Melissa McCarthy and for John Hamm, uh, that the studio loved. But then they, you know, both actors kind of felt like they weren't sure if they wanted to do it. Which fair enough, you know. But then, um, and then, I just was looking for other projects and really looking around. And then I signed on to um, to do the remake of um, uh, the French film The Untouchables. Which is one of the best movies I've ever seen in my life. I mean, it's so if you guys, it's the greatest movie ever. And Harvey's Harvey Weinstein's company wanted to do a remake, and I signed on, so excited, and I wrote this script for it, and everyone loved it. And then I just had this moment of like, why am I going to remake a great movie? And it just it was like, like all you, how can you, all you can be is as good as that movie. Best case scenario. That was that was my feeling on it. You know, I, I think you know, I, I think. Um, uh, somebody else is going to do it now, and it'll, it'll, it'll be great. I mean, it, it's really so good, but just this moment of like, is this, 
but again, it, it, you know, there's a paralysis that can happen that is good and bad of like, when you have a hit, because my agent would have warned, warned me about that too. It's like, some guys just will kill themselves looking for the perfect project and then so much time will go by that then you suddenly, you know, your heat drops off or whatever. No, I mentioned Sandra Bernhardt as a perfect example, quite frankly, of that phenomenon. It happens. Yeah, yeah. After King of Comedy, mm -hmm. she was she or and her people, yeah. one could say were a little too precious with what to do next. Well there was another there's a cautionary tale for me was also a guy who, who was I was on the stand up circuit with for a while. Um, Jeff Wayne, who had a moment of extreme heat because he had this one one man show and I remember it just took him so long. You know, fair, fair enough. You want to get the perfect thing, but I remember it just took him so long to figure out what the thing was, that it just you know that especially so, when, you're, when you're an actor, it's just like you know. So, but so that's in your mind as well when you make decisions like this one with the Untouchables. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it was tough because uh, you know I re was really happy with the script I wrote, and they really they were very supportive of it. And I knew you know who I wanted to cast and everything, but. But into the middle of that angst, dropped this script out of the heavens for the the heat that I just did, and and it was, it was called the Untitled Female Buddy Cop Comedy, and I I had had a conversation with somebody you know a few months earlier who was talking about like you know two women as cops, and I was like that would be really funny, like but I was like I don't know how to write that, like I have no take on how to write that. I remember thinking like I wish somebody would write that, and then that thing showed up my house and just like. I got to read this immediately. And I was getting on a plane to New York and got on this plane and was reading the script and just like 10 pages in, I'm like, holy shit, this is so funny. And I knew Sandra, Bur Sandra, Sandra uh, Bullock oh. wanted to, I <laughs> got Sandra Bernard, sure. man. Uh, Sandra Bullock wanted to play one of the roles. And I, you know, I've always liked Sandra Bullock a lot. Um, and I like the idea of working with her. But then as I'm reading it, I'm going like, who could play this other, co uh, other cop? And then it's like, Melissa. And it just suddenly the script, which was hilarious anyway, written by Katie Dippold, who's a Parks and Rec writer, she's fantastic, just got even funnier. And so I remember I'm on that plane, I was like, I need a phone or something. I had to call somebody. And landed and, um, and immediately called Melissa's manager and said, like, she's got to read the script immediately. This is the part. And he said, well, she has a script. She hasn't read it. Read it. Then I gave it to my wife when I got to the, our apartment. And she read She was just laughing the whole time. And, um, and it just became this thing where suddenly... Boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. And to the point where I had literally just seen Melissa off to, to Atlanta because she was going to do Identity Thief. So I, all, my whole thing was like, oh, man, I missed her window. I missed her summer window. Because she's, she's, doing, Molly. she's doing a sitcom. Yeah. She's got four months. Yeah, so it's going to be at least a year before I work with her again. And then, yeah, so this thing shows up. And, I, and I, so I immediately kind of scramble everybody. And it's like, when would we have to shoot this to be able to get her? And like, it was basically eight weeks, for, eight weeks from the day I picked up the script for the first time. And you were probably used to getting more than eight weeks of prep. Yeah, especially on a script, which is great. But still, you, we got to do our process to it. Because once we know who the characters are, you know, the actresses are, we got to meld it to them. And there's always things to fix, you know, and, and, and to get in there with. So this was like crazy. And the whole time, everybody's agents were like, it can't happen. It can't happen. She can't do it. She cannot, you know, there's not enough time. Even if we get her in that thing, there's only six weeks. And you can't do a movie in six weeks. But just like, some, we were just, you know, myself and the churn of people were just like, well, we can't let this die. And, and it worked out. It weirdly worked out to the point where we shot for six weeks with Melissa. In the last two weeks, two or three weeks, she had to take a private jet. She'd fly back to, to, to L.A., do Mike and Molly, and on her days off, fly back to us. And while she was gone, we'd shoot all of Sandra's solo stuff. And we pulled it off. And in and, and the last few test screenings we did, we scored 96s. Jesus. Which is, wow. I know, which is... A, Unparalleled. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. So, you know, so touch wood, who knows? I don't want to jinx it. You know, hopefully people will show up. Too late. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, we're so dead. I'm glad you got the 96s. <laughs> Sorry, ladies. Exactly. Right. Frank At least knows. you had that. Yeah, exactly. Right. You got a tattoo one there, one there. But no, but I'm, I'm, I'm really excited with it. Really excited about it. And, and it feels like the perfect follow up. So. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. <laughs> well, we're, we're up against White House Down. So. Oh, <laughs> against the big same genre. Movie. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. How could you possibly compete with the, yet another they've taken over the White House movie because the, <laughs> the most recent one did so ridiculously well. Can I mention, can I, I just want to briefly Please, mention. Please, Sammy, dive the hell in. A Paul yeah. Feig film that more people should be aware of. I am David. Oh, thank you, sir. I uh, was, you graciously invited me to a screening that you had at the Arclight many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. And I rewatched the movie not that long ago, maybe about a year ago. 
Oh, it's a really wonderful, sweet, moving film. Well, it, it was it was my thank you. Sam. And it's not it's not a comedy. It's not a broad. It's nothing. Let's be clear. It is it is. It's not the feel good concentration camp. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, this was yeah. This was yeah. A, a a very what a, a noble misstep. I'm very proud of it. I'm very proud of it. But it was this weird thing. It, it all has it's. <laughs> To get heavy. No, it has to do with my, my mom died right at the end of, of Freaks and Geeks, like the two days before we got canceled. <laughs> she died out of the blue. And um, How wonderful the universe aligned those two things up within 48 hours. Which makes getting your show canceled two days later like, really? Really? That's all you got? Couldn't have waited. Couldn't have waited. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> um, so I, but, you know, it was a, obviously a devastating thing. And kind of my mental state with losing the show and losing my mom and everything and then this book got sent to me you know probably about I don't know, six months later or something called I'm David which is this book that all kids school kids read in, in England uh, um, and it's basically about a kid you know yeah in a labor camp you don't know what it is it's a concentration camp is it a labor camp it, it didn't read like a concentration camp it read more like a communist labor camp who escapes and basically tries to find his mother and I think it just for me was like you Unnecessary, know. yeah. Journey. I just, yeah. I was like, this is the mother issues in this, and I just, I saw it so clearly, and so I did it. But it, you know, it was, it's a drama, um, with thank mo moments you, of levity. But, but thank then. goodness you had this expressive art form. Yeah, to, yeah. To also have this cathartic. No, totally. I mean, it's it's one of these things. If you you know, I always try not to look back and go like, oh, that was a mistake. Because you know, if you're happy with where you are, you go like, it all happened for some weird reason. But without question, though. But there was a long time where it was like, I mean, it literally ate up. I think a good two and a half to three years of my life. And it all ha it happened very again. Another thing that happened fast. I got sent this book. I wrote a draft of the script. Everybody loved it. They wanted to do it, and we like slammed into production. We did it, but then. It took us a little too long to edit the film because I had to fire my first editor who, who was in London and it just it didn't work. And then we brought on a, a new guy uh, who's great, Stephen uh, Weisberg, who you know, did like Harry Potters and stuff. And he was awesome, but we were behind. So it took us longer, so it was a window where they really wanted, they were excited about it, they want to put it out. And it took us longer than that to edit it and get it right. Um, and then... Once again, ultimately up to the audience, whether they're in the right frame of mind to embrace it. Yeah, it, 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 that, the hard thing with that was it's a, you know, you can't, I don't know how to test screen a drama because you go like, are they crying? <laughs> you know, are they feeling anything? I know, are they Look excited? What's going on? So all I would could latch onto is the moments of funny, you know, comedy moments. Go, like, okay, they're laughing, you know. But here's where I knew we were dead. Uh, it's all together. We're got it. We're going to do a big test screening out in Irvine. So we go, place is full, movie gets this amazing response. People are clapping. They're all, I was like, oh my God, we're hit. Thank goodness. So, yes. So I'm out in the lobby and I'm watching everybody leave the test screening and there's somebody at the door and they're handing these little white envelopes to everybody as they walk out. I'm like, what's that? And they go, well, when we told people what the movie was about or described it, no one wanted to come. So we had to tell them we'd give them each $5 if they came to see the movie. And I was like, well, we're dead. Yeah. We're dead. No one's going to show up to this movie. You literally had to pay the audience to come see this film. Air conditioning and free soup. Yes. So, <laughs> and then beyond that, then we couldn't even get a distributor for it. Oh. So, yeah, so, and it just, it was just a nightmare. Well, when we finally came out. Yeah, that notwithstanding. Yeah. No, but thank you, Seth. But I am a fan of the movie. Thank and you. I think more people should seek it out. And I think they will. Will be a fan Thank of it. And I'm very, I am very David. proud, very proud I am of David. the film. I'm very yeah. proud of the film. You can get it on Netflix. It's, you know, it is what it is. But um, Write to us at contact at kevinpollockschatshow.com. If you get a chance to see this film, let us forward your comments to uh, the fine filmmaker. Unless uh, they're mean. And it's, and it's pre-Jesus we'll, we'll Jim sure Caviezel. You don't get <laughs> no, I want it all. It's pre-Jesus Caviezel. It's pre-Jesus Caviezel. Yeah. Yes, Who could ask was. for more? Exactly. I, <laughs> that, we was had a... that was my stripper yeah. name, by the way. Great Jesus Caviezel. <laughs> you were great when you were dancing. Under Thank you. Moniker. Uh, no, it was crazy. I mean, we literally, we had the casting director who did Passion of the Christ, and she ended up taking six of our cast members that we found in Bulgaria and all this and put them all in Passion of the Christ. So Mel, you owe me, you mother. <laughs> <laughs> Yet another... <laughs> Person, Mel. another strike oh, against me. Just right down. Angry at Mel. Yeah. <laughs> uh, are you ready for six, uh, three degrees from Kevin Pollack? Yes. Uh, how many degrees do you need to get to me? <laughs> one being just one person we've both worked with uh, that connects us. Uh, how many degrees do you think you need to get to you? Yeah. I weirdly feel like we can do it in one. I think we can do it in less than one. Really? Because zero means we've worked together. And we did in a film I like to call 
that thing you do. Oh my God, that's right. You're in that. I forgot. About that. That's right. You forgot I was in it. No, no, no. I haven't <laughs> seen it so long. No, no, no. <laughs> I better remind folks uh, uh, your uh, brilliant performance oh, yes, in the film was, uh, as the uh, DJ. Pivotal. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, what a perfect film that is oh, as well. I love that movie so much. It's so sweet. It can play on a continuous loop in my house. Yeah. Uh, on every other screen. It does in screen. my head. Yeah. Or at least the music does. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Well, wait, wait, remember everyone was criticizing, the, oh, do you hear that song so much? It's like, I could hear that song a million times. I love that song so much. Which Tom Hanks also co-wrote. I mean, he yeah. did Crazy. so amazing in every aspect. And what I love about that movie, it's a tone you never see in movies, which it, it's just a sweet movie. Right. There's, there's, you always go like, okay, when's the drama where they all fall? It's like, it's, even when it's, the drama's happening, it's still kind of sweet and fun. It's just, it's it, lovely, lovely yeah. movie. There's I like only to one call it magical. Magical. I think it's a magical film. I'll it is magical. I'll back you up on that. <laughs> There's only one flaw that I can think of. Not in, enough in an otherwise Pollock? perfect film. No, wow. no, perfect amount of me, actually. <laughs> You're going to go with that come over and that rouge, and you can only have so much screen time. Those are the rules. I remember that. No, that Ethan Embry's character is referred to in the credits as bass player. No, TB player. The bass player. TV the player. bass player. No, oh. T, T period, B period, player. That's the, the character's name. Right. Well, that's no not the character's name in the film, though. No. Yeah. <laughs> and I know? think this was a little bit more of an important character in the film than there's a, T you know period, the reason? B period, please. <laughs> because Crowd member. Because Hanks' reasoning was is because they always, like, you never knew, the, ba the bass player, I guess, was always, like, the throwaway, like, in the band. Like, nobody ever, like, you know, but he was never the heart. He's throw. like the drummer in, right. uh, in uh, Spinal, Spinal Tap. So, yeah. it's like, so it's like, you never knew the bass player's name. He was always just the bass player. So that's why he, didn't, he purposely didn't give him a name. Aha! Uh -huh. It returns it. to perfection. <laughs> <laughs> he knew what he was doing. I was well looking done. for the flaw, and damn it, there isn't one. <laughs> oh, and someone in the Why must you always tear things down, correct. Kevin? Can't think of the um, well, that answers the Facebook question from Tom Jackson Jr. Is there a genre other than comedy Mr. Feig would like to try, like ah. action or drama? The answer is yes, he did. Mm. I am David. Check it out. Yes. Uh, I like action. I like action comedy as well. Well, the spot, uh, are we allowed to say anything about the thing you might be working on next? The thing sure. You're working Why not? On that, uh, you want to try to capture a female spy film. Yes. So you've written a script and you're close to handing it in, and, mm -hmm. and um, so we're in that phase. Yes. Is it yeah. Salt Two? No, exactly. Ah. That's my goal is to make it where it's not like a woman who can beat up 300 pound guys. Right. Like, this is like an actual like what would happen if a, if a woman who's funny, but you know, but I, I I like things that are. Re, you know, where the, the story is real, the danger is real. That's like in the heat. I mean, some people who are Bridesmaids fans go, oh my God, you, you shoot people in this. The, yeah, but it, you know, I love 48 Hours. I love Beverly Hills Cop. Yes. Where you go, like, it's funny, but they're in real danger. And the bad real guys stars. aren't like, yeah, clowns or anything. Give so, me a reason to care. Actually emotionally involved. Me. Yeah, because then you're just going joke to joke if you don't have anything like that. And so, th so then I'm doing the same thing with this, this, you know, because I'm a James Bond fanatic. Yeah. yeah. Have yeah. you seen this recent documentary? Oh, yeah. Oh, man. So we watched that uh, a couple, like a month ago. It's so good. It's extraordinary. I wish I could remember the name of it because it's, I oh, highly uh, recommend it. Oh, shit. It's, it's something like With or Without You. or It's, some, it's got some weird name, but it's, that's not it. But yeah, well, just... Uh, look on Netflix. Well, look up put James, James Bond. And it'll James come Bond up. documentary. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm excited as hell about the... Uh, Prospects of the Lady Spy. Yeah, I, I'm I'm excited about it. Oh, I got to give a shout out to my wife. Please, Lori. I almost forgot to give a shout. Out. I didn't forget. I was waiting for the perfect moment. But That's uh, exactly right. I exactly. Think we both were. Can I also give her a shout out? Yeah. Hey, Lori. How are you? Nice to yeah. see you. See, how are you? Oh, Hopefully well. Nice. But oh. no, I, I'm excited. I, I, I'm really, really thrilled about it. The studio's excited. You know, they bought the idea and stuff. So, we'll see. I hope that one goes. Very quickly. I do as well, because I hear my part is fantastic. Yes, you are. Wait till you see. <laughs> wait. Just wait. Um, I love your editor's uh, use of the term. Oh, hi, Laurie, for me as well, please. That's better. Um, uh, I think she managed my ex-wife's career at one point. Mm. Yeah. That's You're how correct. I first met yes. her and if exactly. you. Uh, when I think we tried to hire you for something. Yes. Um, and we're wildly unsuccessful. <laughs> Uh, the proof is in the pudding with the test screenings is one thing, but your editor has this great theory that I'd love you to share with the audience, which is uh, Angry Villagers. Yes. I'd not come across this before, and it's kind of perfect. It's, it's, yeah, Bill Kerr, who edited Bridesmaids, uh, is, is a font of these brilliant theories, because they're all completely right. 
uh, which is, yes, The Angry Villagers, which is, it basically is saying we as filmmakers are the ones that can ruin everything. Because nobody ever goes to a, a movie to s see a bad movie, like, and especially comedy. People go like, I can't wait to see this, gr this great movie. So why we are so, have to be so hard on all the jokes in the movie, but especially in the beginning, is because audience sits down, they're like, oh boy, I can't wait for this comedy. We're going to laugh our asses off. And the first joke comes and it's like, okay. And they're like, huh, all right. Well, the next one will be funny. Next joke comes, hmm, that's not so funny. Next one bombs. And enough of those happen and then the villagers get angry and they want to burn down the village. So, uh, so that's basically why you got to be so hard on those things. You can't have, because that's the, especially the first two, three, four. Uh, attempts yeah. to be funny because oh, yeah, totally. they'll want to burn down the village if they come at you early with that interest yeah. and desire mm -hmm. it's that much harder to get them back. totally it, b better that you have a slow start you know it, you don't want to swing and a miss you don't even want to swing in a single you've got to at least hit a double e each time yeah. because it's a trust issue with an audience they are they are deciding the beginning of the movie do I trust the people that made this movie? that's exactly it mm -hmm. I try to tell uh, in the stand-up world you know, you constantly ask for any sort of advice. Mm. And I remember the great Marty Cohen, who was an icon favorite of mine, mm -hmm. Party Hardy Marty from oh, Solid yeah. Gold Place, oh, yeah. but in San Francisco, <laughs> he was quite the man. As I came into the comedy scene in the late 70s, and he said, watching my first time on stage, you know, when your uh, material catches up with your stage presence, you're, you're going to be something. Uh, mm -hmm. let's, hear, let's hope that happens someday. <laughs> I'm not sure it has. But what, oh. what I learned was, in the first 10 seconds, yeah. Relax the audience's sphincter. Mm -hmm. Let them know they're in good hands. Mm -hmm. That's what they want. And I think that's what struck me about this angry villagers thing. Yeah. They just want to know they're in good hands. Oh my God, totally. I've, I've come for you to please take me somewhere. Don't, like when you read a script as an actor in the first 10 pages, I got to know. Yeah. Am I in good hands? Yeah. Does totally. this guy, per person, female, whatever, know what the fuck they're doing? Yeah. And you're, I just love that. No. Angry villagers. It's so smart. Because also, you're, the, you're Dr. Frankenstein. Yeah. Oh, totally. You're I mean, building the creature. Yeah, and you are. I mean, you are God. You are God for the for the time that those people are in that theater. You can either ruin their lives or you can make their lives wonderful. I love, you know, coming from the stand-up world too. You know, when I was out doing, especially when I was out doing uh, open mic nights, trying to start, seeing that moment for everybody who thinks they're a comedian, and it's everybody gets up full of piss and vinegar because you know they've all been standing in front of that mirror at home rehearsing that first joke, first line, and hearing in their head huge laughs. Genius! Oh my god, and just to see people die. Like see that, that look in their eyes like the life drains out of them when they hit that first <laughs> one and like it's nothing and it's like oh boy. How you handle yourself in that moment is oh. Everything and ever just uh, wobbly off the rails and you know so that's you know it, it's it's but it's the best lesson you got to learn because you know it, it, that, that's even the thing like you know somebody who's famous who goes back out on the stand up circuit what I forget who said it was it buys you like two minutes or something right. like that yeah and then then the same thing I mean look at poor Charlie Sheen who discovered that on that. His yeah, I could take this tour. show live. This this right people train. love me they'll watch me do anything well, they won't turns out not anything. It needs to be something. Yes. Um, but you got to remember that in everything. I mean, you know, as a filmmaker, anything, it, they may show up. It's even worse if they show up and then you don't give them something that's great because then they're like, hey, fucker, I just <laughs> came out and spent money. So during the editing process with this favorite editor of yours, <laughs> one of my favorite editors, he just turns to you and says, Angry Villagers? Uh, like code speak? It more it, it, no it, at that point it, when we're in in the in the the weeds it's more about like it's 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 a swing it's too big of a swing it, it's usually that kind of stuff where you could go like, I don't know it's kind of funny it's like you don't want to take that swing <laughs> you know and, and um, you know my other editor who I work with who's amazing Brent White who you know edits all Will Ferrell stuff you know it, it's it, it, they all realize the good comedy editors all know that and they'll always try to steer you away from from those things, and you learn more. You know, if anything, I get nervous about jokes. I'll pull them out just because I'm like, I don't think they're going to destroy. And right. That, again, that's why you want the test screening thing. Because I've had a million times where things, I go like, oh, we should pull that out. It's not going to be funny. That kills. Right. You know? Yeah, I just worked with uh, Chris Guest on his new show with oh, Chris, Chris O'Dowd, O'Dowd, who you once again might have launched here in the states with the Bridesmaids. Mm. I'm just saying it might have been. He's pretty great. Um, yeah, he's phenomenal beyond belief. But I talked yeah. to Chris more extensively, also him being a guest on the show. 
that, you know, I'd always heard that editing is the final rewrite, but more to the fact of get as much great footage as you can yeah. knowing that you get extra time making something of it. Yeah, um, definitely. In his case, you know, 90 hours. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, that, I mean, that's the danger. I mean, but, you know, the, the whole theory is that you never want to, you know, Judd always planted this seed in my head, you know, e e e you don't you shoot for the editing room. Basically, you never want to have a scenario where you go, "Oh shit, I wish I had this." And we were all there doing it. That, that's my whole thing with movies in general is, you know, you kill yourself to develop a project, and then to get the, the studio get behind it, blah, blah blah. It's all so much to get to that moment when you're on the set with the cameras. And so then when you get there and they go like, "Okay, we got an hour to get this scene," and you know, and you just do. It's a, why would you squander that moment that you've killed yourself to get to, and not get everything you need to get? And just right. like try this, try that, try this. You know, try this thing. So in case we lose that scene after this, we can have a bridge, so we don't have to go back and reshoot. Because reshoots aren't aren't any sign of a failure. And yet for me, I go like, I don't ever want her to shoot. Just it feels like opening up the body again. You know, right. you, know you left your watch inside there. So, <laughs> so, so, so that that's really what it comes down to. And the other thing, I mean, just to get all kind of the Please. basics. Of, uh, your, cr I, I love our, you know, we love our crews, but the one of the worst things you can do as a comedy director is start playing to the crew, having the because. Th Crews get bored very easily because you know it's their job. They're just they're on the set all the time. I've seen it all. Yeah, and but you have this when you get the crew to laugh, it's like the greatest thing in the world. But I find generally that's not the thing you'll ever use. And what happens is, you they're start, more jaded, by the way, than the show business creative. Totally, and they're tired and they want to get to the next setup too. So they're kind of like, you got it right, you know, the like Cam <laughs> Roberts always go, I think we got that. It's like, no, we don't have it. We do not have it yet, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but. That becomes a dirty thing. Like there was a thing in the heat that I just did where we had this whole scene of like, it was written really funny. It was like she's chasing, you know, Melissa's character is chasing this guy, and they're doing all this stuff, and then they fall over this wall and they get hurt, and then and then it said, and now it's the slowest chase ever, and it was just kind of described really funny in the script of like slowly trying to get each other, and so everybody's all excited, like they they can't wait to shoot this scene, and so we. Get it, we get there, and everything before that is going great with this car chase. So we do that, and we start shooting it, and just I think we all had it in our head be looking this one way, and we just can't get it to work. And it's just like, and it's everyone's getting so depressed, and the crew's getting angsty, and we're just like, fuck, it's not working. And no one's quite sure why it's not working. No, we just can't get it right for some reason, just like it, the, the, you know. The, it just it's just not working and the actors are working their hearts out and they're doing great i just feel like i couldn't get the camera right or something and um so literally we end that you know i shoot all this stuff for it and we end going like oh my god we've so failed to the point where i go okay get the cameras over here let's do have lay them on the ground and just like they fall over and they just go like they can't get up and she goes you're under arrest and he's like okay you know just so we got an end to the scene so i can not use this thing that i completely fucked up <laughs> get to the you know my editor gets a hold of it Cuts it together. I'm going. Like, I think it seems kind of funny, and we do first test screen. It destroys. I mean, it like it's the one of the biggest laughs we get in the movie, and it and it just. I only bring that up now. That I'm so great. It, it, it's it, it's like you know you get so thrown off by what happens on the politics of the set and the, what the, how the crew's reacting and how the producers and everybody that you just have to power through that stuff because you don't know the magic does happen under the editing room and you just go like as long as we get all the pieces go you know smart enough to go like keep going you got to get this piece you got to get this piece because you got you know even if it's a disaster we got to edit it together and um, so in the end it was the lying on the ground handing the cuffs saying, no it wasn't that it was the entire slow chase it's right. the slow chase destroys um, with gags that we're coming up on the spot because we're so desperate, like, oh, we need something funny. <laughs> and there's one that, you know, it's, it, so, yeah, I'm It's like, nice it, to know you felt in the moment that you had failed horribly in capturing the, the exact tone and timing and pace and footage and performance, yeah. and yet. And yet, and actually, I ended up having, I actually shot it really well. You know, like, when you watch it now, you go, like, of course, how else would you do it? But it, it's also the problem of, and it goes back to the casting thing, you get stuff in your head, and nobody, 
outside of your head knows what it was supposed to look like. Right. And I think as a director, you're, I think Zemeckis or somebody has a great quote about like you show up in the morning and you spend the rest of the day watching your vision get slowly, you know, under underachieved or something like that. <laughs> you know, because it is true. You show up like this is going to be great, and it's like oh shit, that didn't work. You know, but again, you don't. The people don't know what's in there, and so they're just seeing the thing. You know, yeah. that's these people doing it. But that's what I love about it. It's it's that's why you can never be, you know, kind of like, don't tell me stuff and don't, like, not take input from people. And well, it's one thing for you to place the blame at your uh, inability to articulate what's inside of your head. Mm -hmm. It's just not that easy. Mm -hmm. There are 19 participants in any given moment mm -hmm. who are delivering their version of what's inside your yeah, head. You, yeah, you get a lot of input, you know. But again, if you, if you, you know, it's worse if you kind of, you have to... You're, you're such a ringmaster for ideas when you're directing because good ones are coming in and bad ones are coming in and and positive reinforcement and negative energy is coming in and, and you know I'm not that confident I've never been that confident so I'm kind of always like are they right because I think more mistakes happen when you go like fuck you guys don't know but I know I know because then you don't know really you want to <laughs> you want to get all this stuff and go like okay I think that's good let's try that version let's try that version you know, the whole auteur thing is, you know, it's kind of bullshit in the end of the day because, you know, clearly it's kind of coming through me because I'm the, the clearinghouse for these things. But at the same time, you know, with actors, it's like not, nothing makes me happier than go like, can I do one more? I have an idea. It's like, yes, please. But then you hear about these, you know, directors who won't let that happen or I think it's more on television where it's really, you know, like. We don't have time for that. Yeah, don't have time for that. Or the, the sitcom guys of like, you can't change that word. You can't change that word. It's like, I think they can fucking change the word. Again, you're not Shakespeare. Those are two things I keep my desk. I have a model of the Titanic because it seemed unsinkable. And so it's, it was a me, perfect machine. Yeah. And for me, I go like, no matter how great everything seems, we could still go down. <laughs> and, then, and then I have to keep a bust of Shakespeare to remind myself I'm not Shakespeare. Right. So never go like, oh, don't touch this. Well, we talked to Michael Chiklis on this show, and it turns out Shakespeare isn't Shakespeare either. Um, ah, see? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I know a lot of people watching and or listening to the show right now in so many different ways you can watch and or listen. They've all been thinking the same thing. Yeah, this conversation is delightful. Yeah, it's insightful. And yeah, it's mesmerizing. But when the fuck are they going to play Who Tweet? <laughs> <laughs> Sammy? Did not think you were going there. Cue the music. <laughs> Celebrities have so much to say. Who tweeted? Is the game we're gonna play. All right. Sam Levine, ladies and gents, bring you. those paws together. Thank He's so here for the next 3.2 minutes. Thank you so very, very much. There he is. All right, so the game is Who Tweeted? It's sweeping the nation. Hmm. Uh, all the theme song. So here's how, uh, here's how the game is played. Uh, one at a time, I'm going to read a series of eight tweets. All of these tweets were written by either Tyra, Paris, or Bieber. <laughs> Nice. Uh, at any point that you think you know who mm. authored the tweet, who penned the tweet, perfect. Yes. You ring in by saying your name, ah, which is Paul. Oh, it's, so we as don't. Far as, as I recall, don't go. Eh, as far as I recall. Oh, nice. Uh, well, then I will point you. You have three seconds to say Tyra, Paris, or Bieber. I just like the opportunity to yell out my name. Perfect. <laughs> you ring in, you get it right. You get yourself five points. You ring in, you get it wrong. You're going to lose three. Oh. Uh, once a question has been answered either correctly or incorrectly, that's it. We move on. All right. Are you ready to play? Because the winner will be walking away. Oh, what? Holy There's money involved? Holy. 20 Cash prizes? Look U.S. Oh, dollars. Oh, I need it. The dancing that Andrew money. Jackson. That, that right there, my friend. <laughs> That'll buy a lot. Get some tonks. That'll buy a lot of peanuts. Yeah. You can get some tonks. Yeah, that's right. A lot of peanuts. Get, I'm getting my. I'm getting my nice. free sample. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a Jew, three, man. Three, <laughs> please. That are three and a half months of cellular service. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Exactly right. Good. From ting. All right. Are you ready to play, sir? Yes, I am. Here we go. Tweet number one. Bum bum bum. Met a young girl named Molly that made me smile today. Bull. Oh. Beaver. Ooh. I'm so sorry. Damn. Tyra. Oh. What was the tweet the, again? The rest of the tweet. Met a young girl oh. named Molly that made me smile today. Who turned up the corners of your face today? <laughs> well, that would have clearly been. Clearly, that would have been the giveaway. Really That's all right. Nuts. It's all right. It's early. It's early yet. Gun. Tweet number two. Last time we played the game, I think, the first there were eight questions... Uh, first six of eight were answered incorrectly. incorrectly. Yeah. Oh, good. Battle that's of the negative. I think that's probably going to happen again. <laughs> Battle of the negative. If I have anything to say. Like. <laughs> tweet number two. Yeah. Just finished an amazing photo shoot. Kevin Beaver. 
We are into the negatives. Ah, yeah. yeah. You. Ah. It's was, all tied up. This is Paris. Oh, Ms. Paris Hilton. Taste that 20. <laughs> Tweet number three. Candy, a little help. <laughs> Pop that collar and chase that dream. Paul. That's got to be Bieber. Come on. Tyra Banks, oh, ladies and gentlemen. Man. That's all right. That's We're all right. We're three for three. Oh, three for three. Man. You guys are rocking this thing. Pop that collar. You see what our head writer, Danny yeah. Fox, did there? She threw us off the track. Yeah. All while collecting snakes from other towns. <laughs> <laughs> All while connect, collecting and whacking snakes. Come on, snakes. Paul, my money is on you because uh, oh. the $25,000 pyramid, man. Come on, bring it Thank back. Thank you. Come on, be, bring my it back. be my Lois Nettleton. Come on, bring Tweet it back. Tweet number four. Ate something funny. <laughs> Stomach ain't right today. Show Kevin must go on. Tyra. Four for four. Oh, that was Paris, right? That was Bieber. Oh, God damn it. <laughs> Jesus. Well, that's why we designed the game. Oh, this is man. fabulous. My guest finally feels like a failure. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Who tweeted? I just we tweeted in my pants. Yeah. Yeah, we can't can let you. Oh, All right. Okay. Here, we, Here go. we go. Here we go. Game faces, gentlemen. New ball game. It's tied up at negative six. Tweet number five. Smile. It's your best accessory. Paul. Tyra. That's Paris. Unfortunately, that is Paris. God. Damn. That's all right. Five for five. All right. That's all right. It's fantastic. This is great. This is great. This is almost more fun but you than see if you guys were getting the, these all correct. Again, if I may give credit to our head writer once again. The, each one of these tweets is absolute anyone's fucking ball game as to who wrote the damn thing. All right. We've, She's also picked ones that do seem like that was more fashion, so I thought. And so right. kudos. Pop the collar. Kudos you think kudos. of fella. Mm-hmm. Fuck. Tweet number six. Just want to get one right, Kenny. Round of applause. <laughs> On goes the spotlight. Life is cray, not plain black and white. Step it up. Change. Paul. It's got to be Paris, because it doesn't seem like it would be Paris. It seems like it would be Bieber, but I'm going to say Paris. <laughs> He's got you inside your brain and back out again. It's Tyra, of course. It's Tyra, man. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it. That's all right. I've That's crushed right. the spirit of our guests, people. <laughs> I'm getting out of the business. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a sham. I'm a failure. No, no. I won't, have, I won't have any of that. Just two right answers. You're right back in this. <laughs> okay. By the way, at this point, if anyone gets a right answer, we're six for six on the negative. That is correct. Right. That's right. That is correct. There's I have no not heard a single answer yet. Right. Not a single correct answer yet. Tweet number seven. Resting up. Relaxing. Chill day. Kevin Paris. Seven for seven. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this makes me so happy. Oh, no this idea. is God. glorious. It's a new record. Okay, here's here's what it, here's what it breaks down to, fellas. Yeah, it's anyone's game. With tweet number eight, uh -huh. uh, Kevin, you ring in, you get it wrong, we're tied. Right. You ring in, you get it right, you win. Paul, you ring in, you get it right, you win. Tweet number eight for all the Andrew Jackson marbles. Excited for Coachella tomorrow. Kevin. Going to bed. Paris. Winner. Most unfortunately, that is correct. Oh. <laughs> Most unfortunately? What do you mean? <laughs> Look at him. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, uh, but I, I he bow, had me gainfully sir. employed for a year. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I bow, sir. I bow to your greatness. Oh, please. We got one out of eight between and us. See? And I guess that's how you play who tweeted. Thank you, Sam Levine. <laughs> oh, One boy. of the best. Celebrities have so much to say. Who tweeted? Is the game that we just played. Sorry about is that. It, is that Sam or Joe Montaigne? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite sure. <laughs> it's supposed to be me, but I was busy that day. You're Joe sat for me very for, nice. for the artist. Or, yeah. Elaine, or as in La Elaine and says, Edward G. Robinson. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a little bit of that going on. Uh, do you have any insight how someone should win the $25,000 pyramid? Should they uh, re- uh, Yes. Introduce the game? Did you have a a trick as a way oh, to find the whammies? What, what he's, got, he's got more than a trick. He was on How, the, Oh, no, you won. Oh, yeah. You won oh, no, $25,000 exactly. pyramid. It's, it's a legitimate question. How it, that? It's from uh, spending your entire childhood watching that show. <laughs> I, I you broke the them. code. Yeah, that was my favorite show, and for some reason, but it was I. I when I won, I remember I, when I watched the tape. Still, some things I go like, I, how did I? I can't believe I in that moment I thought of I knew that. Not that they were hard, but just in the moment, 
I was uh, very lucid. So Then that allows me to segue into the single most important question that I think not only Eight inches. Well, I want to know, uh, not about your hot, li <laughs> hot links, um, but rather what the audience is dying to know as well, and any fan that's uh, developed uh, of your work and your insight into what makes entertainment. How often do you watch the tape of you winning $25,000? <laughs> <laughs> because you just said, even to this day, whenever I watch, whenever, yes, whenever, whenever I watch. <laughs> Whenever that is, I haven't seen it in a while. But apparently, it sh plays on Game Show Network because every once in a while, a tweet will show up. Or you'll get a check for forty-eight cents. Yeah, no, I don't even know. I don't even think I, I get it. No, no. no those Lee, are my they, they pay me off. Kevin. Lee Press on Nails will show up, but uh, <laughs> yeah. I did get. I did get a, a, a what was it, a year my, supply of was it year supply? Yeah, which was a small box. So I thought maybe I don't know. I guess ladies wear them for days at a time or months. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, and you, was it Lois Nettleton, literally? Yes, Lois Nettleton I won with. It was uh, Bill Cullen was the other celebrity, and but then Lois Nettleton, who... Brings I, us back to Shatner in Star Trek. Mm. She was the one with the checkerboard uh, blonde uh, hair. Exactly. Upswept. See, exactly. Yeah. And, and she was also kind of the queen of the, like, the TV movies. for all. She was a wonderful woman. Yeah. But here's a terrible story that uh, happened. So, literally because of her... My stand-up, my career in comedy began what? because I was I was out of film school. I was working for producers, a script reader, but desperate to get back into stand-up. I you know I'd done it as a fifteen-year-old, but then that didn't count really. Um, and so uh, went on the show and won this money, and it allowed me to you know leave my job, which I loved, but I want and, and to go full time into stand-up, like you know, and I did. And, from there, things went well and slow. Um, so flash forward to I'm doing a, a pilot at NBC um, for Rodney Rothman, and it's about kind of like a retirement community where, where a guy, young guy moves in there. So we're seeing all, all the older actresses in town. Lois Nettleton comes in. I'm like, oh, my God. And I can see her name on the call. She's like, oh, God, finally, I can <laughs> finally thank her. I can finally thank her for this. She comes in. She's so sweet. And, and, and you know, as an actor, you go into, you're usually ready to do your your audition when you walk into a thing. I go on this long, torturous, thank you for blah, 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 you know, like, like this. and I see her and she's listening to me and her eyes are starting to get watery, but I don't think it's because she's happy, it's like, I'm, I think I'm completely fucking her up. <laughs> so this long thing, everybody's like, oh my God, so like, and now will you audition for us? <laughs> and this poor woman, you know, got, and she was fine, but she was great, actually, but she walked out of there like, we had crushed her soul. And I just, Not like, we, by the way. Yeah, I, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> because I so fucked her up. But, but then the, the good thing was, but then we brought her back in, and she actually almost got the part, and then the, you know, the network went some other way. But I did, I did bring it back around, because she was great. But just remember that moment of going like, oh my God, this person I've been waiting years to thank, and I just completely. So from that experience you learn, let the person come in, do their best, and then walk them out and exactly. say, oh, by the way. If they want to talk, that's fine. And I start like a hey, monologue. Well, the judge's joke was always, every actor leaves one of my auditions thinking they have the part. <laughs> because I, you know, I, from years of, you know, of us all auditioning, like, I'm so desperate to make people feel good uh, because, you know, there's nothing worse than with people walking out of an audition where they just you see they don't think they did well. Yeah. The few times I've been on the other side of it, I have been a half hour behind within the first three actors. Oh, yeah. Because oh. it's three different a attempts at it with notes. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely making sure they had every opportunity to leave it on the totally. on the floor, as it were. And, and I, think, I think all these acting coaches and teachers now, I have to think they say, like, if they don't give you an adjustment, then it wasn't good or you're just not right for the part. And so, but sometimes I'll see something and they're great. Right. And you go, like, I don't have an adjustment, you know, and they'll walk out crestfallen. Or sometimes you go, like, they're just not right for the part. And, you know, like, and when you're behind, this is like, they always go, like, okay, I got to break some, I got to crush some souls now because if they're not good, I can't give an adjustment. They just got to go, you know. Yeah. Oh, it's the worst. It's the that, worst. That reminds me, Paul, uh, did I, I, are you still casting that part in Unaccompanied Minors? Because I haven't heard back from you yet. Uh, we're going to make a decision very soon. Very soon. Yes. yes. Okay. So just hang on. I know it's between me and Wil Wilmer Valderrama. Yes, exactly. So, you know, you know. hoping you go young Jewish guy. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to do a little CGI. I'm going to put you ah, in there. That's good. <laughs> in there. That's good. <laughs> Never give up.
Never give up. That's the important part. I don't, I don't think I've lost any parts, really. <laughs> nope. We can Spielberg that shit, change it right up. <laughs> well, that's like, like when you, you know, I stopped telling people like back home that when I was an actor that I'd have auditions because you'd be on the phone with like a friend and go like, oh, I got to go get an audition. Oh, great. And then they, three months later, they're like, so how'd that audition go? Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> what? what yeah. Oh, I didn't get it. Oh, yeah. loser. And like, yeah. <laughs> This is always a great thing too when you like tell people like I'm on this show and then you all sit around watching you're not on the show <laughs> like nobody bothered to tell you you got cut out of the show. Yeah, my um, first uh, appearance on the Tonight Show. I go into great detail about this in my book, How I Slept My Way to the Middle, <laughs> a copy of which will be in your gift bag. So <gasps> Excellent. Signed uh, not by me but by someone. <laughs> um, I go into detail about that first time because you've called now 64 people to say, watch The Tonight Show. I'm on tonight. Mm. They've been waiting as long as you've been waiting, as you've been talking about, you're going to be on The Tonight Show. And now it's happened. Mm. And when you get bumped because Sammy Davis Jr. decides to do four songs, <laughs> no one had ever done three. <laughs> he did four. Of course. And you want to pop out his eye and skull fuck him. <laughs> um... <laughs> You now have to call 64 people and say, yeah, don't watch tonight. <laughs> and then you have to have 64 conversations where they try to talk you down from the clock tower with the M60. Exactly. And make you feel better about it. I'm sure he'll have you right back on again soon. He's such a big fan of yours. And 64 of those phone calls. Mm -hmm. And then you eventually learn. And, so, and, and my honest, truthful question is, do you have this theory of jinx, don't talk about something, or do you get to a playful place where you can say, knock wood, as I've seen you do now a couple of times, you know, mm. we've done our best, all hopes uh, that things work out the way we'd like them to? Yeah, uh, I... I mean, you've been through enough of this now. Yeah, I, I get, I'm not a superstitious guy, but I get, I just get, I'm always prepared for the worst, and so, and I think it does come from those days of, of, of stand-up, going like, oh, if I tell somebody, you know, or right. appearances. Yeah, I... I uh, I just get really nervous. I, I'm afraid of overconfidence. Yes. Terrified of that. But then, you know, you don't want to be you know, the humble brag or whatever, the false humility of, oh, we don't know. You know, look, the, the Heat, I know I've got Sandra Bullock in it, who's the biggest and one of the biggest movie stars in the world. Melissa McCarthy's on fire. We'll be, yeah, we're probably yeah, going to do... Test scores. We're probably, yeah, we're probably going to do pretty well. It's just, it's all this game of like... How oh, well? please let it be bigger than the other one. Because you know? <laughs> right. there are these weird expectations now, too. And it's sure. Kind of like a, a, You've a box proven office yourself. number that we would have been dancing in the streets about previously now will seem like, oh, okay. And it's like, oh, fuck. So yeah, it's now April 21st. Mm -hmm. Too early for the question, how is it tracking? Right, not tracking yet. But there's a window. People may not be aware of this. There's a window that happens... How many weeks before the film comes out, where now you've actually got people from the marketing department or the studio honchos that are t letting you know directly mm. the film is tracking to this number. Yeah. And then it's staggering how right they are 96.8% oh. of the Those time. Those predictions are horrible because, yeah, they are usually... Spot. It's like the bookies who lay the line in Vegas. Then you go, how did they know four yeah. points? Thank you Although for motioning were... to me when you said that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Although they were wrong on uh, Bridesmaids. Of course. And when crazy. they're wrong, yeah. it's incredible. They can't wait to sink a ship. Oh, my God. And that was, I mean, that was the worst, the worst day turning in the best day because it was that, for some reason, they, they decided to do a midnight showing on Thursday night of Bridesmaids. It's like, it's not Batman. Like, people are going, I got to see that wedding movie <laughs> at midnight. <laughs> so, of course, it didn't do that well. And so they're all We're like, fucked. Yeah, these calls coming in like, well, here's the thing. Pretty, uh, we were always told if we made less than 20, it would be considered kind of a disaster. So, which makes no sense because it would only cost $32 million to make. But uh, only, only. Um, so first call in from one of my agents in the morning. I'm literally, I'll tell you all, I'm sitting on a toilet taking a shit. And, and the call comes in from the agent. <laughs> Lori, that's just for you, my friend. She loves when I talk about that stuff. Um, and he's like, well, looking like 13. I'm like, oh, fuck. You know, just like, yeah, What are you basing thing. that on? Yeah, well, on the, you know, they, first thing, they got that number. And Thursday boom, night. Yeah. Th was, that's the thing. It was oh, no, totally. On. Thursday night, then maybe like a morning show or But the something. tracking, this thing I'm talking about, where a couple of weeks out, they, oh, yeah. they can tell you. Yeah. Oh no! That, How it's tracking. Yeah. So before the Thursday night disaster, it was tracking to do. It, it, it was it was wishy washy. It wasn't tracking to do that great. I think 
That's why I think they kept saying 20, because I think it was tracking to do around... Between 19 and 23. Yeah, exactly. We, we need to get that 23. Right, don't go to the if low it's number, a 19. go to the high number. <laughs> That's right. Okay, what can I do? <laughs> yeah, but then the weird thing, that, but then that day, like, you know, it, it wasn't moving during the day. It was like, well, they're thinking maybe 15 now, but it was great, because we, Melissa McCarthy and her husband Ben, who's in the movie too, came over, because we live in the same neighborhood, they came over for dinner, and as we're eating dinner, the calls start coming in like 18, 19, it's looking like 20, it's looking like 20, and by the time, by the end of the meal, it was like looking like 26, and we just like piled into the car and drove to the arc light and went in, and the, the theater was full, and it was so exciting. Yeah. Because that was really, I mean, that, that I, I always referred to Bridesmaids as strike three. You know, because it's like, if this one doesn't work, I'm fucking dead. I mean, I, you know, I fortunately got pulled out of the crypt a little bit, you know, to, to direct it. You know. But it's a grand slam. Yeah, it worked out So great. now, although we're not going to make any predictions and we're going to stop knocking wood, <laughs> what is your prediction on the tracking number that the studio will insist is the oh, low God. and high? Let's oh, pick God. that range. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because uh, now you've proven yourself. So I now know. I need 26 to 34. Yeah. No, you're can't taking be that years high. off his life with this. It can't be that high, right? Oh, right. <laughs> Can we play uh, Who Tweeted Again? Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> that was so much fun. <laughs> Do you think it'll be the low end will be as high as 26? Because that's where. Uh, yeah. Right? I, that's what they like to do to you. They oh, like to, no, totally. Yeah. I, I think it's. Yeah. Between I, 26 and 32. That's the spread I'm going to give you. Okay, I'll take that because I actually think it's theirs be might higher. be even higher. <laughs> yeah, there's be, yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying to make this better for you. <laughs> I'm getting out of the business. <laughs> isn't that, isn't the, the weird thing? That, TV was so nice because you do it and then it kind of, it, you know, it's, at least directing, you know, you do it yeah. and then a few weeks later it comes out. Hey, it was fun. You know, but movies, you know, you, it's a year of your life and, and you're just kind of like. Yeah, no one's tracking your episode of. Uh... <laughs> it's very, really. <laughs> And then I don't get blamed. Either, right. So that's a nice. Your agent's calling in the morning. Well, it looks like the going to be three, four yeah. point eight million viewers. Oh my god! No TV directing is the greatest because you're you're you don't get blamed for anything unless yeah. it's a disaster. But you get Even, credit. Yeah, you get a little bit of credit if it goes well. <laughs> right. Exactly. But um, no movies is just like hey, and here it is at your feet. How excited are you about Arrested Development coming back on the Netflix? Oh yeah, I can't wait. Jamie, what's the date on the Arrested Development debuting on the I, Netflix? I just know it's mid May. Oh mid May. Sure what's well, that soon? Oh my yeah. god, I can't I wait. Can, you know what? I have the internet in front of me. Yeah, well, yeah, look that and, up for me. And I know they're doing the, the House of Cards that's all episodes at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, no, and I, it'll I, be known as the day Netflix explode, imploded on itself. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it really will crash. How soon into your experience working on um, Arrested Development did you look into Jason Bateman's eyes <laughs> and, and find it uh, difficult to refer to him to, as anything else other than the sun? Yeah, he was. I mean, talk about an amazing transformation. I mean, he he's so, he's he's just so smart. He's such a good comedic performer. He's it's, solid. It's unreal. Yeah, I mean, the just, deftness and that command of things. I mean, it, it's 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 really doing that show was so much fun. Because, I mean, the whole cast was ridiculous yeah. from top to bottom. Any which way you you yeah. you looked, you mm -hmm. you've got greatness unfolding. Yeah. Um, Michael, of course. Uh, well, well Bateman was is it was so serious about what he does. I mean, he's super analytical about it in a great way. Yeah. You know, so he would really like, you know, there was no frivolity around his character. He was really like always finding the the truth and things and even like, you know, I didn't feel like I would enter here and it's like, oh, okay, cool, you know, that's that's great. Whatever I'm for whatever makes an actor feel like he's really in the part or she's really in the part, I'm all for. And I was always really amazed at how, like how dedicated he was and how thoughtful he was about stuff you know but that was such a fun set I mean Arnett would just I would have to get as far away from the set as possible because he would just he would just destroy me I mean yeah Will Arnett is arguably left. one of the funniest human beings oh, on the planet and yeah. rarely are they able to uh, capture his brilliance yeah on film or TV because he, he has that magical rhythm in life that you cannot believe how funny he is oh I know it's just that over serious thing and well you know feeds all these weird moments <laughs> like what where is that coming from will it's so fun but he was you know he, as you know he wasn't a comedy performer really no. before that and I think that's why I love you know that's why we love the Leslie Nielsen's of the world and all that they just yeah. there's something you know Rose Byrne was not a comedy person really I mean she did get was hilarious and get him to the Greek but then you know on, on bridesmaids just like wow you are hilarious but yeah. in that great Steve Carell way where they just become the character so they're not like looking for jokes they're not trying to be funny they're just like they inhabit this funny character and then they just you know are able to interact as that person and then it's just naturally funny right 
May 26th. May 26th. Memorial Ooh. Day weekend oh. is the big launch. It's actually, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a launch. Monday. It's a Monday uh, morning, midnight, technically. So if you're on the West Coast and you stay up late on Sunday, wow, you can watch Absolutely. the first few before you go to bed. Those servers are going to crash. Like East Coasters, you're out of luck. <laughs> I'd Sorry. like you to start gearing up for your Larry King game. You were mm. uh, warned ahead of time. I know. Um, in the meantime, I would ask people to consider um, the the books the, that you spent a good deal of your life working on. Mm. Um, you've got the uh, science fiction series of books for, for um, mm -hmm. young adults. Young adults. Mm -hmm. um, and what a success those have been. <laughs> oh boy. Well, wait a minute. What about. Kick... I mean, creatively, very okay, successful. But, but, but Kick Me and Super Stud. Those have done pretty well. Those, those are, are phenomenal books. Thank you. Sir. Those That should be required reading in schools. Thank you. Well, actually, there's a few places in Chicago where they actually have kids have to Part read. Part of their curriculum? Brilliant. Yes. Brilliant. So those schools should have their funding pulled immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give folks the full titles of those books, please. Um, uh, uh, well, there's Kick Me, Adventures, in, Adventures Adoles in, Adolescence. in Adolescence. That's one. That's one book. Uh, then there is Super Stud, or How I Became a 24-Year-Old Virgin. Mm -hmm. And then the kids' books are uh, Ignatius McFarlane, Frequenaut. And then the follow-up one is... Uh, I forget what it is. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> it's another one. It's no, called I mean, Ignatius McFarlane. So we didn't tell him this was going to be on the test. Oh, boy. Yeah, I no, think exactly. you've sold it already. I'm the ultimate salesman, really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. When you said But uh, I'm very, very proud of those books. Let's they, be clear. They, I mean, the kids that read them love them, I right. will say. And parents go, oh, my kids never read a book. Well, I mean, those no, are the smartest kids. Exactly. We like those, but apparently there's not very many of them. So. Well. <laughs> you can't compete with, with, with vampires. I get killed by vampires. You can't compete with the C minus students who make up this country. Amen to that. Yes. Thank you, sir. Although you'll never go broke underestimating <laughs> their power yes. and their numbers. Amen to that. All right. I stalled as much as I could regarding to your Larry King oh, game. When you're ready, that's your camera. You'll simply look into it. If there are any props, any glasses, well, you have your own glasses. Oh, that's right. But if there's anything I can give you to help uh, facilitate, remember, it's a bad Larry King impression. Please don't bring mm -hmm. a good one. And then um, uh, Larry, not you, Larry starts sharing something about himself that nobody needs to know. <laughs> and it could date back to his first ride on a pterodactyl. He's very old. <laughs> Uh, and then when you go to the phones, the name of the city should be funny sounding. All right. Here we go. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Larry King. Now we're... Wow, this is really bad. Uh, uh, yes, good. Please. Good, actually good. That's perfect. There you go. Hi, Larry King here. I have anal leakage. Run Kunkamo, you're on the air. <laughs> <laughs> and that is how you play the Larry King. Thank you, first Thank you very Kunkamo. much. I, I, I actually averted my eyes from the camera when I did it, so it's, it's, it's technically a little off from Larry. So I, got, he can't I was, get I was enough ashamed of, as I did it. Exactly. He can't get enough of staring down the barrel. <laughs> That's right. You had to look away. I had to Why? look away. Why? Because you have a well, beating heart. It was, it was a more <laughs> introspective Larry. <laughs> That's right. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Um, I can't thank you enough, honestly oh. and truly. I've uh, oh, been yep. a fan for a very, very long time. And I of you, sir. Uh, please remain seated. Mm. Um, <laughs> but honestly, uh, thank you for making time for us a couple of hours here on a Sunday. Oh, Kevin, my pleasure. It, it, it my means God. a great deal to me. And um, can't wait to hear more about uh, the heat, and we'll do some follow-up on that as well. Yeah. Um, and now, uh, literally sit there uncomfortably while I wrap things up for the Perfect. folks at home, but thank you ever so much. Thank you, Kevin. You are the best. Well, it's been said. <laughs> uh, thank to one and all who uh, tuned in uh, live or after the fact, whenever you're catching us, write to us again at contact at .com. Sammy, Jamie, thank you both so very, very much. And Kenny as well to round off the uh, in-studio mm -hmm. personnel. Out there, you've got Samantha Ward on makeup. You've got uh, Josh Negrin our uh, wonderful intern who does uh, most of the work for none of the money, David Mandel. And, uh, Give him that 20 you won. Yeah, Come right? On. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Settle that. He also, <laughs> he also dances on command. He also nice. dances on command. It's like, dance, David, dance. Yeah. For, for which, my uh, amusement. A quarter. Which may be the pay, we're, may, that may be the pay we're offering him, the opportunity <laughs> to dance for it. <laughs> and Jason McIntyre, who I mentioned before, that uh, should be mentioned again. Um, I think that's it for today's particular show. We had a uh, slight uh, reschedule for next Sunday. Um, watch for the Twitter, at Kevin Pollack, for the announcement of who the live guest is going to be, for those of you watching live. Um, and then uh, the names I mentioned before, the guests we have upcoming. Go to our calendar, uh, the schedule on the KevinPollockChatshow.com 
uh, homepage, look under schedule for upcoming shows. And again, by all means, please be involved as you'd like to in the show. We love hearing from you. So don't hesitate to contact us. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Thanks, Tonks and Ting. Until next time, and as always, oh, Elaine Ewing, our social media maven. Ah, I knew I was forgetting. <laughs> Kevin, can you get Tang to uh, sponsor the <laughs> only? <laughs> we could get Ting Tang. Tong. 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 Bing Bang Tongs. <laughs> nice. Okay. All right. Oh. And with that, now get out of my face. <laughs>